Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode 123. And as you can see, we've got a very special guest on the show for this uh, West Coast Sunday morning special. Mr. Damon Gilbert is going to be joining us today. Uh, and the first thing that I just wanted to open the show with right off the bat, because you guys have not seen the podcast in what feels like forever since like a month ago, we had a uh, coach and Christine on the show to talk about the Ocean States. Um, I have now finished my time on the wards here at the military hospital here in Tacoma. Uh, so I'm going to be on clinic, which means my schedule is a little bit more predictable, which means you guys are getting podcasts a lot more frequently, starting with this Sunday morning special and starting with this man right here, Mr. Damon Gilbert. And Damon, I'll give you the opportunity to uh, introduce yourself to our audience a little bit. Man, thank you for having me, Jackson. Uh, it's, it's a huge honor, huge privilege. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Damon Gilbert. Uh, Team Paul Mitchell fighting coach and chief instructor of uh, Best in the West Martial Arts Academy uh, here in the Bay Area in San Leandro, California, and a true awesome. Oakland native. <laughs> and by the way, I want to open the show with a, a short little story about Coach Damon. And that is, uh, I've gone on the record many, many times on this show talking about how I, how I am a fan of point fighting. That if you've got like forms and weapons runoffs and you've got team fights going at the same time, I'm going to watch team fights. Like I am a fan of point fighting. The reason that I am a fan of point fighting is the man that we have on the show today. I remember the 2008 New England Open. It was team fighting finals, uh, JPM and All-Stars on stage. And uh, I was, I, I don't think I was on stage that year. Yeah. My first time on stage was Diamonds of that year. So I would get on stage later that year. I was not good enough to be in the finals at New England Open. <laughs> I'm like sitting, I'm sitting in the crowd. And uh, I just, I hear this guy that's just yelling, right? It's not somebody on stage, it's just somebody like backstage just yelling and like hitting stuff. And uh, I'm like, what, who is that, right? <laughs> and then as I see this, this person going on stage, I realized that it was Damon. And it was Damon like getting hype for this team fight uh, where ultimately I think in the anchor spot of the team fight, he'd wind up fighting Ray to determine who was going to win. And I forget the score. I forget who won. That's not what matters. But I got like, more points that day, but they won teams. <laughs> but Ray is my guy. He's the GOAT. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but watching like the, the passion that Damon brought to that fight and then seeing like Damon versus Ray, uh, that was the fight that made me a point fighting fan. And, and I never looked back. Um, so I've been a fan of Coach Damon's for a long time, even though now, obviously, uh, we both have roles with Team Paul Mitchell and we've known each other uh, for what feels like forever now. Uh, but once upon a time, I, I was a fanboy who uh, you turned into a point fighting fan. Um, so with that, Very uh, talking about you being the JPM fighting coach, the first thing that I want to talk about is probably what most people tuning in want to hear you talk about is we've got a whole bunch of new fighters on this team. So I'm just going to throw you that alley-oop and I'll let you slam dunk it. Yeah, you know, um, for me, um, picking fighters and picking people to come on our team, um, it, it, it's, it's not a right, it, it, it's a privilege. Um, so I, I know I've heard criticism over the pandemic about, uh, you know, JPM is not having that many fighters as they used to and things of that nature. Um, you know, why don't, why don't they combine with like another team and do stuff like that and, and to each his own. Uh, but for me, uh, at this stage of my career, um, I, I honestly want to bring people on a team uh, who I know they're going to bleed black and white. It's going to be in their DNA uh, and there's going to be a certain level of loyalty and a certain level of professionalism um, and a certain level of uh, perfection that we can possibly get in the future. Uh, and these additions that we have put on our team have been people that I've been watching for quite some time. And our sport is so young right now. Um, it's all about, for me, my perspective is like the farm system. It's all about uh, your homegrown talent and bringing that up. Um, it's not like the era in which I came up. Uh, you already had mega stars when I was a rookie. You still had Anthony Price out there. You still had Mafia Holloway. You still had Pedro. You still had Kevin Thompson. You still had Richard Plowton. You still had Hakeem Austin. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. Ray Wizard, and the list goes on and on. That's not what it's like now. There aren't a bunch of legendary legends. Uh, it's a very young sport right now. Um, so uh, I'm really happy that I have some uh, young fighters uh, that I truly believe in that we're planting seeds on 
and putting water on those seeds right now. And I know they're going to flourish. But the biggest thing for me is I wanted to bring people on the team that looked at the team the same way I did. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then we're not going to really mesh because my passion is up to here. Uh, my, my, my loyalty is up to here. And so I needed fighters with that same oomph. And I needed, most importantly, fighters that appreciate the opportunity to have uh, a proven sponsor and a sponsor that has proven that we're going to have um, stability uh, financially and longevity. And so people sort of think that's uh, easy and it's not that easy. So I, I really wanted to make sure I got two things out of anybody we brought on the team, which is I needed uh, fighters that were hungry and fighters that were humble. And when I start seeing that, I start bringing them on. And there's some more to come, uh, but I'm really, really excited. Um, Sebastian um, is amazing mm -hmm. um I, I never thought about bringing in a teenager on our team until i saw him mm -hmm. and then i realized that the sport is very young and that i think that this young man especially coming out of the school that he trains at at bears uh with uh master Vito, he's only gonna get better and if he's this good right now uh as long as he keeps his head on straight and listen to Vito, uh sky's the limit you'll be calling him one of the best kids ever or adults ever to wear black and white. Uh, and I saw the same thing with Jake as well. Um, coming out of Trevor Nash's school, um, Trevor is near and dear to my heart, him and Casey. Uh, I know what kind of pedigree they put out there. Uh, I had the honor and opportunity of standing behind Chelsea uh, for many years coming out of the United School. And they just breed some of the best martial artists on the planet. Um, so seeing his skill set and knowing where he comes from, no brainer for me. And again, he was extra humble and hungry. Uh, Katie uh, probably scratched and clawed to get on the team the most. Um, you know, I scouted her for over a year um, and she's done amazing, uh, way beyond expectation. And the more she hangs out with Master Nash, uh, Casey and Trevor, it's gonna be a problem. And then with Sean, um, I will always, California, I'm talking to you. I'm looking <laughs> at the camera. I'm talking to you. I will always bet on the Bay. I will always bet on California. Why? Because you know what it's like to scrap from the bottom. That's how I got on the team. And I don't want people to have to scrap as hard as I did to get on the team if you have the talent to get on. So, Sean, that's why I brought Sean on, because I will always, always, always go back to the Bay when I need to find some talent, because I know we have it. We just don't get the opportunities to come to the East Coast because it's financially very difficult. But, man, uh, I get goosebumps talking about him, Jack. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited. Uh, and just watch what we do. And we got more coming. Uh, it's all about that H&H, &H, hungry and humble. And if that's you, this is the team. I love it. I love it. And, and there's, there's something to be said for that combination of talent, loyalty, and passion. Right. If you have those three things like it, it's important to change with the times. But when you look back at it, really, that's what JPM has always been about. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. The, the age demographic is different than it used to be. Right. I remember being a 14 year old on the team and all of my teammates were like 25, 26, 27 years old. Right. So the age demographic has certainly shifted, but the sport has shifted, like you mentioned. Some of the guys that are out there that are winning the overall grand championships now were picked up by teams when they were 13, 14 years old, maybe Absolutely. fighting in the men's division when they were like 16, but that's beside the point, right? Absolutely, and, and, and they, they should, and they should be point. able to. I agree, 100%. You're spot on, you're spot on, you're spot on. 100%. In a, and we're, we're going to go off on an aside here, but this is something I'm passionate about as a forms and weapons guy that wanted to go and compete in the adults when I was 16. I even said, hey, I won't take the prize money if I win, just let me do it. Right. Wow. Uh, wow. And even for point fighting. Right. Because everybody talks about like the risks of having somebody who's not 18 in the adult division and injury right. and liability. But this is a non knockout sport. This is not a sport in which your intention is to incapacitate your opponent like an MMA or a boxing. This is a sport in which it's all about who lands the clean technique first, not right. who lands the hard technique. Is there inherent risk? Of course, you guys are hitting each other, but I don't find it inherently dangerous for a 17-year-old who's really, really skilled, who consents to fighting in the men's division to do it. I'll let you speak on that a little bit. No, you, you know what's funny is, I mean, you bring up some other really, really cool points. Um, and in this era of sport karate, um, I, 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 I think a kid should be able to bump up 
whenever their instructor says go for it. And the reason why I say that is when I came up in the 80s and 90s, uh, when I was a junior, the promoter came up to my dad here in California when I was 15, 16. And it was like, he has to go to adults. Mm-hmm. And that's how it was just it was just a different energy back then. And they made me go to adults. And my dad was like, fine, because I was sparring adults the whole time. Uh, but also you bring up another fact um, that, you know, today's sport karate, it isn't really built off of what it re- originally was, which is the old school blood and guts era, which is you're going back to the 50s and 60s, no gear and everything is and you are getting dropped. You are getting flattened out. Um it's not like that. However, I, I wish it was because that's really what it was in its in it in its in its infancy. And what it, at, at its best, it really was hardcore uh, contact. You're banging, but you're stopping. You're stopping mm-hmm. when they say stopping, but you're hitting them with clean techniques. And uh, I, I wouldn't have a scar on the back of my neck and all kind of other issues I have from fighting as long as I did. If I didn't fight dudes who, who were doing that and were thinking like that, because that's the way we train. Uh, and that's one of my little turnoffs now is that I don't see the young fighters. Uh, and I'm just saying this era of fighting. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. see the banging. And I would like to see it uh, because I think it's important for us to legitimize our sport. Uh, when people want to do stand up, I want our names in the mix. I don't mm-hmm. want to just hear Muay Thai only. Um, and it shouldn't be you look for us only when you fight Wonder Boy or if you fight Sage. Then they're looking for us to help their camps out. Uh, but we have legitimate, credible stand-up. Uh, but when you look at the way the rule structure is, and if a fighter, an MMA guy Googles point fighting right now, the only thing they're going to probably see is somebody's hand going up and you're missing the contact. But you mm-hmm. saw the person claiming the point. Uh, so I think if we go back to like the real essence of, uh, of Kumite and where you're actually hitting hard, uh, I would love to see that. And I, I don't really see that. So now you get more of a, a tickle type of sport a little bit. Uh, not a fan of the, the 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 jab to the body. Like, come on. Uh, not a fan of a blitz where the person is using the back of their hand and it's not a reverse punch. Uh, you know, human flesh doesn't sound like a slap. You hit somebody in the ribs, it sounds like a thud. Uh, but, you know, that's what we see in our sport all the time. And here's my biggest one. And this is just me being a guy almost 50. I'll be 50 in August. This is me being a guy almost 50 who loves this sport. Why do we have elbow pads? Why are we the only combat sport that wears elbow pads? Mm. It, it's visually, it's gonna not, we're never gonna go where we need to go. Mm. We're, we're not gonna attract the masses. We now have social media. They didn't have that in my era when I was fighting in the 80s and 90s. Mm. Later on, yeah, but not like it is now. Like we can really control the narrative and put out a lot of cool stuff but it has to be appealing to the masses. If mm-hmm. UFC is the number one combat sport, and then now you see this, we look like Power Rangers, we're not going to get that audience. Though many of us have spent more time at our trade than no superstars, mm-hmm. and, it's, and they're all amazing. But right. I think visually we have to see if we can do some stuff, whether we have to get part of a union or we have to be part of a commission and pay mm-hmm. the money to be able to have more contact. But I think having a combat sport with elbow pads I think it's it's a bad look. I think it's it, I, I don't see our sport elevating if we keep doing these type of things. Um, yeah, we got to get rid of that, in, in my opinion. And I'm nobody, but what I am is I am a lifer. I'm mm. a sport karate lifer. I've been uh, I've been in love with her since 1980. That was my first, <laughs> and I still can't let her go. And I and mm. I was five or six years old, and I'm almost 50, and I'm still in love with her. I can't mm. let her go. That's why I coach. So. If we get more lifers, then we get a better brand. We get more lifers. We get an actual audience. Our audience can't be the participants. Uh, you, you can't make money that way. You can't be a superstar. Gordon Ryan is amazing. I love jujitsu. Mm-hmm. And all he does is tournaments. And the guy's a multimillionaire mm-hmm. off of BJJ tournaments. Yeah. We were around way before BJJ tournaments. Mm-hmm. Why are we light years behind them? So I, I just think we got to change some stuff. But I don't know mm-hmm. what you think, Jack. Well, you bring up a topic that I'm very passionate about and that I've gotten on my soapbox on this show a number of times. And there's two places I want to go with this before we get back on track. So the first thing that I want to talk about is you mentioned shifting the focus from the spectators being the participants 
to your audience being really your primary income source. And I have screamed that from the mountaintops that if, if promoters remain focused on the year to year profit, if they remain focused on get the competitors so that I make the money, instead of focused on the long term, let's grow our viewership so that I'll make more and more money every year that we do this because I'll acquire sponsors and I'll acquire streaming deals or television deals. And I say streaming deals because I think it's a lot easier to get those and they can be a lot more lucrative than what TV is right now. I don't know why somebody hasn't gotten on the phone with Amazon Prime. I don't know why somebody hasn't gotten on the phone with Peacock, right? And get some of these sport karate events streamed there as well. We already have streaming capacity. SportMartialArts.com does a good job with that at a bunch of events. Juventex is starting to do some more of that with their events as well. Ocean States is getting to the CW network. So tournaments are doing a good job of kind of starting this trend towards streaming. But let's make the big jump. Let's focus on how many eyeballs we can get instead of how many participants we can get. Because at the end of the day, your number of participants that are going to bring the eyeballs is about 30. All the best point fighters, all the best forms and weapons competitors across the age groups, male, female, you're looking at about 30 individuals. Those are the individuals that matter to grow the sport because those are the individuals that people want to watch. And the more people you get watching, that's going to have a trickle down effect. And the more participants will start showing up because little Johnny will see us on Amazon Prime and he'll say, this is what I want to do. He'll go to his local karate school. And instead of stumbling into the tournament scene, like many of us do, because we did karate (laughs) first and then we found out we could compete. Right. Then people are going to be starting martial arts because they want to get to this level just like the UFC or one championship or Bellator has that with MMA right now. So there there was me on my soapbox. Here's the other thing I want to ask you about. Absolutely. I feel strongly that the biggest barrier to entry for being a point fighting fan is education. Because if you show some random guy on the street, even with some martial arts experience, let's give them a red belt in any style you want. right? Right. So this is an average fan with some martial arts experience Um, that sees point fighting and you let them watch a two minute fight for a grand championship, make it two marquee opponents, right? 99% of them are not going to have any idea what just happened when the fight ends. They might be able to see, Oh yeah, that was a really clear defensive sidekick, but that was one clash out of the the 20 that happened across that fight. Right. So in my opinion, from a streaming standpoint, and this is the segue is we need slow motion replay. We need slow motion replay with breakdowns so that between rounds, you can go back and you can look at two of those clashes and you can say, hey, this is who hit first. This is the technique that was landed, right? That's also going to help hold our judges more accountable. And here's the other thing that instant replay does. And this is what I want to get your take on as a coach, as one of the best coaches in the game, right? I think that if we had instant replay capabilities only in the night show, right? Not daytime grands, not through the division because everything would take way too long. If it is a fight on stage in the night show, whether that be a runoff, whether it be the overall, whether it be a last man standing, an open weight team fight, whatever. If it is a night show event, coach gets a single challenge flag. And because you have instant replay at one time during that fight, coach can throw their challenge flag. And here's the other thing it does. Think of the entertainment value of that, right? One of those calls that really should be a clash, but the judges point one way or the other anyway. And so somebody gets a point and everybody's like, oh, my, how'd they call that? Right. And then you throw your challenge flag. You go back to the slow-mo. It goes on the projector screens at the event. Everybody watching from home sees. You see the slow-mo. You see which hand connects first. And then it's easy. You're going to get more reliable outcomes of your fights because we all know there have been fights that have been ended at the buzzer because of the momentum calls, right? Right, right? You're able to break up some of that momentum and it adds an extreme amount of entertainment value to the fight while educating the people that don't know what they're looking at. It slows it down and shows them what they're looking at. Your thoughts on that idea? I think that's solid. Uh, I think that's a good idea. And what it is also too, it's like having – it's like get having an opportunity to get an arbitrator without mm-hmm. having to get the arbitrator. So you always see coaches, can I get an arbitrator to the stage? Can I get an arbitrator? So it's almost like you have that one arbitrator call as well, but you always see pop up every mm-hmm. fight, every big fight, whether it's like, was the foot out of bounds? Uh, you know, and that's a big thing too. Like, was it in, was they out? Um, was it a late call by a ref? 
Sometimes the flags are coming late and you don't get the point. It's, no, it would be amazing. Uh, it would add some clarity. Uh, it would hold some people accountable. Uh, and I think right now for our sport, because we're, 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 we have a great, we have a great product. I believe so. I don't, I don't think I've wasted 45 years of my life falling in love with this sport. Uh, I think we have an amazing product, but we're not where we want to be. So I think we have to be very adapt to any change uh, because what we've been doing doesn't have us where we can and where we should be. So I think it's an amazing, amazing, amazing thought. I, I'd like to see it happen. I'd be game for it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate your backup. Uh, but now I want to I want to pivot us and, and get us back on track because we've talked about a lot of our newest fighters to come to Team Paul Mitchell. But I also want to talk about the fighter that's been here for years at this point. People don't necessarily realize it because we had a pandemic. Right. But he just had a big weekend at competes winning the heavyweight grand championship. Tell us how proud you are of Alex Mancias and a little bit of his journey, because I know that, you know, all the details that brought him to where he is today. Yeah, you know, Alex is Alex Mancius is the reason why um, I even have a youth movement. Mm. Um, he was the first junior I gambled on, besides Cameron Dawson, but that didn't count because Cameron's family. Kevin Cameron's my nephew, so I already knew his DNA. I got opportunities to train with him. Uh, his dad uh, was my brother; is my brother for many years. Uh, so Cameron was family. So Cameron was different, uh, though. I did bring Cam on as a junior, but. Alex is single-handed. The reason why there is a Sebastian, there's Katie, uh, there's Sean, there's Jake, and there's more to come. Without him, it wouldn't happen. The reason why I say that is I picked him up uh, when he was a junior on his way to becoming an adult. Um, and the biggest thing I got from him is his level of focus and that he was in love with the idea of being on his team the way I was in love with the, uh, being on his team when I wanted to be on his team. He reminded me of me when I was young, wanting to be on the team. Um, I called him on Christmas. I totally surprised him. Uh, I told his mom I wanted to pick him up. I'm doing like, I want to try him out. I want to, I want to bring a youngster in the game. Um, and his reaction is still one of the best reactions I've ever had of anybody I brought on his team. And I brought on Laszlo, Zolt, Tomas, uh, DeAndre Walker, uh, Michael Jefferson. I brought on a lot of amazing, amazing uh, Gina Thornton, uh, uh, Justin Ortiz, the list goes on. I brought on some amazing, amazing martial artists. Uh, but when I made that call to him, he's the reason why I feel like I could do the youth movement. When I called him, I caught him slipping. And you would have thought that Santa brought a thousand gifts because that was his reaction. Um, his whole family was there. They were excited. Uh, they were screaming. There was yelling. There was tears. And I said, if this kid is this serious, I can work with this. And I don't care how long it takes. Uh, because at my root, I'm a martial arts instructor. At, 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 at my essence, I'm an instructor. I'm a teacher. Uh, I work with people who aren't black belts every day and have them be superheroes and save the streets of Oakland and all across the country uh, with police officers. So I, I knew I can have patience with Alex. Um, I knew I was bringing him in young. And to see that passion and hunger that he showed me on that Christmas day, and he lets me continue to give him expectation and give him drills and work in and we're drilling and we're drilling and we have to grow and we have to grow. And the only thing he ever says is, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. It's not, coach, you're riding me. Why are you on me? None of that. It's, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Or what do you think about this, coach? Should I do this differently? Should I change up my diet? Uh, what should I do with this drill? Am I using my fakes correctly? How's my distance looking? He's that guy. Um, so when you're that guy and you're in the lab, at some point, that report card is going to show some amazing grades. Mm. And that's what happened at Compete. Um, he's been in the lab. He's fought his butt off. And it's funny that um, some of the haters, and if you're on the line, you look me in the face too. Some of the haters got to be quiet because that dude's always been in every fight he's ever fought. Ain't nobody just smoked him. Ain't nobody whooped on him. He's been in every fight. So the haters that love to hate, thank you for fueling this kid's fire. Thank you for allowing me to tell him about life lessons. The only way to shut up critics is to be successful. 
and that's what he's going to do, and that's what he's doing. And the only way to shut up critics is to just get in the lab, man, and outwork everybody. Yeah. Outwork them. And that's what he's doing. And so I, I'm, man, I get emotional when I think about his journey and how well he's done. Uh, but he's only scratching the surface. And what's amazing about him is, you know, he's one of the last fighters since like Ross. And of course, K.A. did it at the highest level to even do both, to even yeah. do fighting and right. forms. Like that's extremely hard. Like warming up before a fight is hard. I used to watch the Hungarians warm up and I'm like, dude, they're no joke. They're doing like full 30 minute calisthenics before a mm -hmm. fight. Like these guys are in amazing shape. Go try doing tricking and all this other stuff that this kid does and then go fight. It's unbelievable. So um, I'm glad I took a chance on him. I'm glad he took a chance on me. Um, and I love the reaction that he showed me on that Christmas day. He's the same kid. And um, I can't wait to continue to see what he's doing. I'm not surprised because I see what he does. Uh, behind the scenes. Uh, and this is just the beginning. Uh, but I, I, I like it. I like it. I like everything that's happening for him. That The love, the hate. Hey, <laughs> everybody don't like John Cena, but he's still a millionaire. He's still a top wrestler. Everybody don't like Hulk Hogan. You know what I mean? Like, it mm -hmm. is what it is. Some people hate you when you have success. So embrace the hate, my friend. And he, he better be training right now. He better be listening to this, but he <laughs> should be on the heavy bag right now getting in some work. That's awesome. I love it. And obviously, I'm a huge Alex fan myself. We were teammates. And then obviously now with me in a coaching role, still teammates, right? And, um, you know, that's the thing that impressed me so much about him from the start was we picked him up. He was picked up as, as a point fighting pickup. Absolutely. Next thing you know, he's on stage at the U.S. Open for weapons, competing against me in my last year, right? And then he wins back-to-back -back diamond rings, wins Crazy. the overall the Compete Nationals all in weapons right i mean essentially the guy is like if tyler weaver could fight like that, that is the athlete, <laughs> that's the athlete that we've stumbled upon you know what i mean um and so it, it, it's so impressive for him to be able to do both and for him to be able to do both so well um, yeah. and, and to carry the, the passion and loyalty for this team that he has is is just the icing on the cake and you bring up a great memory, which is any time that somebody gets that phone call to be on Paul Mitchell, right? Obviously, that call with Alex was special. Oh, man. And I'm sure that you've had plenty of those special phone calls over the years. But now I, I want to broaden that out and just talk about, as a coach of Team Paul Mitchell, what are some of your best memories? Whether it be making phone calls to those new pickups or whether it be the, the moment that somebody, you know, reached the mountaintop when, when Zolt got that first overall in, in the in the United States, right? Well, what are some of those big highlights for you that you look back on as a coach and, and you'll remember forever? Well, I mean, there's so many. I, I'll keep them short. Um, one was definitely with Alex Lane uh, at U.S. Open. And it's a great picture of me picking him up and he has his hand up in the air uh, and he won the overall. And a lot of people were questioning was like, did he still have the skill set? Was he still hungry? And, um, you know, he, he, that day, I want to say he fought Ross and Ross was on his A game. Ross, I've only seen Ross on his A game. Um, and he fought like the Alex that used to fight me. He fought and he was a headache. He fought long, he fought tall, he fought smart, he fought strategic. And just knowing some of the private conversations me and him had uh, in regards to, um, you know, some of the naysayers giving him negative feedback or some of them questioning, is he still the man for him to go in there and make that stamp? And, you know, I was on him the whole time. Um, that That's one that I'll take, take to the grave. Like it was just an amazing feeling, um, man, as a coach, uh, sitting back, man, watching freaking Chelsea Nash, mm. um, unbelievable um and for me i was really because at that moment it was just it was chelsea versus chelsea chelsea was dialed in nobody's going to beat her so i immediately start talking to her about like the history and i was like hey have you ever heard of a lady named linda dentley mm -hmm. and i was like we want to go after like linda and nikki carlson lee mm -hmm. like you want to do this a long time and that's what they did they did it a long time at the level you're doing it at right now but they did it for a decade and some change, especially Linda Dentley and Nikki. Um, and so I would focus with her on stuff like that. We would talk about that, but just watching her hunger, her competitiveness, like she's a beast. Chelsea's a freaking alpha. Uh, she will eat you. If you don't want to win, 
she will walk over you and just seeing this little five foot two chick with attitude <laughs> seven foot three, I loved it. And she just went all over the world. And it was amazing. And I, I, I think probably, and you know, what's weird is our last uh, time together was Ireland and she fought, 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 ended up losing like quadruple overtime. It's very hard to win out there. Um, and I remember us just being in the airport and I'm just hugging her and I got the snot and the tears and, and just consulting her. And the mentorship part is more fun than mm. the coaching part. Because for me, coaching is, is, is not only are we going to talk about the arts and all that, but I, I want to get into the life skills component uh, because I've, I've been through a lot in life and I don't want my guys and gals to not understand their moment or not let the moment take them down, but really understand that whether it's a win or a loss, especially if it's a loss, it's just um, it's just part of your journey. And I want all of our fighters to always know uh, you can't have a testimony without first having a test. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times our guys are getting a test. Okay, now you got over it and go tell other people about it. So man, Chelsea was amazing. Uh, Zolt, unbelievable moments with Zolt. Um, because there was a language barrier in the beginning. So it was a lot of me <laughs> using body language and trying to figure out how to talk his talk. And he was figuring out how to talk to me. And it was just un unbelievable. But I mean, this the, the, the team fights where the guys did amazing. Um, the individual fights, just coaching has been, it's been awesome. It's been awesome. Um, for me, it's a different energy because it's not like I coach to live through the fighters. Uh, cause I, I've been to the mountaintop, uh, many a times, uh, I, I coach to hopefully help them navigate, to get to where they need to go to quicker because I've been there and I know where I messed up. So it's this best thing ever. Um, Don Rodriguez is still for me. He's still, you know, Bill Russell, Red Arbach. He's that guy for me. He's still mm -hmm. the goat and I'm just doing my best Don Rodriguez impersonation to be honest. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love that. I love that. So, so many little pearls there uh, that I want to dive into. Let's start with, you mentioned team fights and, and how exciting those were when all the guys were firing on all cylinders. One thing with, with you as a coach in particular, and it's funny because I've watched you coach for so long that I've, I have figured some of these little things out. So I don't remember who it was that I was sitting next to, but it was some tournament years ago. Um, and it was when we had Zolt and Laszlo, J.O. It was that squad. Yeah. And um and I think we were getting ready to fight. Might have been Impex. Might have been Impex. It, really it was, it was somebody, player. somebody that had like a, a a legit anchor, right? Whether it was oh, yeah. Avery or whoever it was, right? And I was sitting next to somebody, and I was like, "He's about to put Richie on their anchor." And they were like, "No, he's not. Like Zolt's gonna fight Dan. What are you talking about, right?" And I was like, "You watch. He's gonna put Richie, and he's gonna let Zolt and Jo run up the score on the other guys." And they were like, no way. And I was like, yeah, way. And then what to do? <laughs> Next thing I know, Zoltan J.O. put up like 20 points and then Richie can, you know, run around and back fist. And, and then we had the fight, right? Uh, so I, I want to dive into that a little bit, of course, without giving out too many secrets, right? Because your your strategy in team fights, some would say is unorthodox. You pick yeah, those yeah. matchups very carefully. Sure. Um, so again, without giving away any of your secrets, <laughs> you, give, us, give us a little sneak peek in, inside the mind of Coach Damon. Yeah, no, you know, and and I, 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 as a as a guy who fought team fights, I I got on my first team and uh, right after I got my black belt in ninety one to ninety two, so you know, I personally did team fights as a black belt adult from ninety two to two thousand nine uh, till the moment I had surgery and had to stop fighting. Um, so I have stole a lot of concepts from the coaches I've had, um, and it really it goes back to um, the age old concept of styles make fights. Um, so you're looking at what does this guy do good against your guy and what's their strength and what's their weaknesses. And if I have anybody that can sort of exploit the weakness and keep them honest, and then we can move some other pieces around, I would like to go that route. So I, I'm always looking at the style, like the style will make the fight. What do I need out the fight? Okay. This guy hates a kicker. Okay. I, I'm going to absolutely put Zolt on him. <laughs> this guy's amazing, but he hates a runner. Okay. Richie can have that, he has that ability to be an amazing runner and be elusive. So I would always try to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I tell the guys to be in the lab, but I mean, I'm on the lab a lot. I'm 
on YouTube and all kind of stuff, watch as many fights. And I have pages and pages and pages mm-hmm. of uh, scouting notes pretty much on what I call the top 25 fighters that we're going to probably run into. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm always testing myself to make sure I memorized what I said they do great, what they don't do great, and see how we can uh, put the chess pieces together. But, yeah, styles make fights. And, um, man, just having the Hungarians, um, you you had a lot of ability to do a lot of cool things. Mm-hmm. Having Justin Ortiz, um, you have a lot of abilities to do a lot of cool things. Uh, I mean, even, man, Cash Sigmund, uh, Elias, Greg, uh, DeAndre Walker, like, man, Travis Plowden, man, you got that kind of talent. It's it's easy to make things happen. And like some of the, I've been watching a lot of the, the, the professional coaches in college and baseball, basketball, NBA, NFL. And, and the fact is, it's, it's true with us, is the, the players win the game. They fight the fight. You know, they do the dirty work. Uh, I'm just there to orchestrate some things and try to be a leader as much as I can. But they do the dirty work. When, when, we, when we're when we successful, it's because of the guys and the gals. Uh, when we blow it, I'll take part of the blame. But they know it's really on them because I didn't get sidekicked. You did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's it, I, it, I've been blessed to have um, fantastic class act black belts in front of me and just have an opportunity to get behind them and share a little bit of my knowledge has been amazing. That's awesome. And, you know, one, one thing we talk about the way the team's been constructed over the years, that was probably the, the prime of like my point fighting fandom was when we had that, that five man deep roster with the four Hungarians plus J.O. And it was so dangerous because you had the best heavyweight kicker on the planet at the time. In yeah, yeah, you had the yeah. best lightweight kicker on the planet at the time in J.O. For and then sure. you had two world-class blitzers in Laszlo and Tomas. And then you had Richie, who could be that elusive defensive type when you needed it, right? And then so you brought in a young, hungry stuff. Cameron Dawson. And then you brought in yeah, a Cam. Exactly. And, yeah, so it and was then you got Cam. <laughs> it, it crazy. Was, yeah, exactly. Good times. Good times. The possibilities there are just absolutely insane, right? So I want to talk about um, what really, in retrospect, was a, a risky move, right? To go and take the first two Hungarians in Zoltan oh, Laszlo sure. and then eventually to bring on more, right? Two phases I want to talk about here. How much slack did you catch when you first made that move, right? <laughs> and then right. what were the things that told you, you know, you just talked about, like, how you like it when fighters can bang a little bit. But typically European fighters don't have that reputation, right? right? And there's right. fighters that are exceptions, absolutely. Right. But most European fighters don't get that reputation like some right. of the American fighters do. So what did you see in them that made you think these guys can hit if they need to hit? Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's that's awesome. Uh, what I, I went to Ireland, believe it or not, for me, my, uh, you know, my, my sport karate career started in 1980. And I've been stuck at tournaments. Uh, I remember being a kid sitting down, watching my dad fight Alvin Prouder, uh, Steve Fisher, Keith Vitale. Uh, watching my dad fight, um, uh, oh, my God, uh, Bill Wallace in an exhibition, uh, I, I, Nasty Anderson. Like, I literally grew up as a kid who was like, oh, my God, I have to do this when I become older. Um, so I love sport karate at its essence. And when I went to Ireland the first time, which is an amazing tournament, uh, but it, it was different for me as an old school West Coast fighter. Uh, because I didn't see the contact and things like that. And I saw the back fist and, you know, guys were getting like DQ'd for real contact. And I was just like, oh, my God, I'm, uh, I can't be that old school to where, you know, this is where the sport is at. Because I just, I, it was hard. But what I did see, what I did like out of my time in Ireland was I saw these guys in this white uniform with blue on it that said Karali. Uh, and they were all from the same school. And I noticed that they did the same fundamental stuff uh, that my dad was on me about. Uh, get a real warm up before you fight. Go into the ring with a real sweat. Uh, get the butterflies out. I watch every Karali kid. They're doing blitz drills, psychics drills, combination drills, kicking drills, movement drills, and they're doing them full speed. And so first I looked and I said, wow, these guys are really in shape because they're doing real warm ups, number one. Uh, number two, I fell in love with the fight IQ of the fighters. And I noticed that all the fighters, they fought to their own personal strength. There's only one, there's only one Zolt. Zolt's the only guy that fights like Zolt. Mm-hmm. Then you see Richie. Richie's the total opposite. Richie's movement, broken rhythm, amazing hands, good combination, uh, you know, fun loving, just, just amazing. 
Uh, Gumby sort of had both. He can kick and punch. Tomas had the amazing hands. It was just they their professionalism to the sport attracted me. They looked like pros. They smelled like pros. Um, and they I can tell that they were hungry and they wanted it. And I just I watched them fight and just an amazing weekend. Um, Raymond did his thing. Uh, I think that you're in a fight in Zolt. And, and, and Ray ended up hitting Zolt with one of the cleanest shots I've seen, especially at that time, probably in the last 10 years. And it was an angle reach hand off of a kick. And that dude, he almost got decapitated. He dropped to a <laughs> knee. I said, oh, he's done. I said, this kid's done. He got up. His instructor checked his nose. Blood's coming down a little bit. You know, RD's doing the dance, and he's doing him. He's, he's having fun with the crowd. He's being the, the constant professional. He's entertaining the fans there in, in, uh, in Ireland. And the kid got up, and he kept fighting. Mm. And I said, ooh. That made me like them more than anything because I was worried about the contact aspect. Mm-hmm. And then when I saw Zolt get up like a champ, I said, hey, uh, I might have to think outside the box. And I, I might irk a lot of Americans, but I, I think people have never heard why. Like, I, I thought it was always weird to hear people um, chant USA, USA, mm-hmm. when the Hungarians were at the Battle of Atlanta or US Open or mm-hmm. Diamonds. Uh, and you can't pick a more humble group, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, all I did for our sport in North America is I brought the absolute best fighters from Europe to America and made it very cheap for you guys to fight them. You didn't have to go to Ireland. You didn't have to go to Belgium. You didn't have to go to Italy. I brought them to you. Mm-hmm. U.S. fighting jumped up when these guys came because yeah. everybody started to get a fire in their butt, mm-hmm. which was great because these guys are pros. They were amazing. Uh, best move I ever made was bringing Zolt and, and Gombi on the team. Best mm-hmm. move. Best mm-hmm. move. Uh, did I get flack? Absolutely. We would hear <laughs> USA chants. With two guys, they would always get hit late. People would always hit these dudes late uh, to try to frustrate them. Um, you will start to hear that, uh, you know, Paul Mitchell is the European team. No, you know what Paul Mitchell is? It, it's a team that's been around for 30 years with an amazing sponsor who's amazingly humble and, and amazingly charitable. And it's a coach who came from the West Coast, and this was a predominantly East Coast team. And so the last thing I'm going to do is make anybody that has the skill set to be on this team not have an opportunity. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I don't care what you're, if you're American, if you're not, if you're white, black, Asian, it doesn't matter. No type of uh, issues with me. I just want the best professional mm-hmm. and a person who's going to appreciate the sponsorship. And that's what I got. Um, and I do it again. If you had four people right now in China that we have the budget to bring, I would bring them. And mm-hmm. if the if the American... Uh, sport karate community doesn't like that, then, you know, that's their own implicit bias. <laughs> and, you know, Absolutely. that's life. That's life. But, no, I, mm-hmm. I love bringing them on. I saw amazing talent. I saw amazing skill set. Uh, and I saw the highest level of professionalism. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the rest is history. Uh, you've never seen any other person from Europe until they started winning win on, on our soil. They never were winning mm-hmm. overalls. None of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zolt started that. He kicked that off and Tomas followed and it was a lot of cool stuff and more people start bringing uh, European fighters on their team. <laughs> so I, I sort of started, nice. but I, I, I saw a couple really good Europeans on some other teams as well. Uh, <laughs> and they're amazing. Uh, one of mm-hmm. the best fighters on the planet right now uh, is uh, with Raymond. Um, mm. I forgot his name. Elijah. Elijah. Everett. Elijah. Elijah's, Elijah's sick. That dude's fire. That dude is 360, has the whole package. Hands, Mm -hmm. feet, cardio. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing about the Europeans. Cardio. Yeah. That's the one thing I will say about Waco. Those dudes are in shape. Those two rounds with every person, those cats don't breathe heavy. They Mm -hmm. don't put their hands on their hip. No. Now, can they take a good shot? That's another story. But cardio, <laughs> oh my God, amazing. The European mm-hmm. fighters are amazing. Amazing yeah. cardio. And that, that's why I had to make that move. And I do it again. I do it again, Jackson, in a heartbeat. If Zolt told me his back was okay and COVID's getting better, 
Zolt, come on back. Let's 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 <laughs> dance again. I, I, I one of the best moves I ever made, and some of the nicest people I ever met, and uh, some of the best friendships I got from that. So it was amazing. I love it. I love it. And it reminds me, I have a, a great Tomas story because you bring up the USA chance and then you bring up like kind of learning that these guys could could bang with the Americans. Right. So there was a year where Battle of Atlanta and US Open were like one or two weeks apart. They were real close together. And I think I think all four Hungarians like stayed in the States for that stretch. Right. They like got yes, hotel yes. or whatever. And uh, Atlanta, I think Tomas made the heavyweight final. Uh, didn't go his way. USA chance, you know, all over. And so <laughs> Tomas was coming into US Open with a chip on his shoulder. And all he's been able to do is just train at a hotel for the last two weeks, right? So we go to US Open. And uh, you could just tell that Tomas was fighting different. He wasn't normal Tomas. You know what I mean? He was he he had the chip on his shoulder. And I feel bad because this team didn't deserve this. We were fighting Germany in team fights at US Open, Okay. And Tomas fought the anchor. We were up by a million. And uh, <laughs> this poor guy that Tomas was fighting, Tomas, it's like second or third clash of, of this round. And Tomas is sitting, sitting, and he puts his weight on his back leg. And it was one of those where everybody, like, eyebrows go up because you're like, oh, no. And then Tomas just unloads this ridge hand, right? Yeah, yeah. Dude collapses. I, I'm pretty sure it broke the guy's ribs. I think he had to go to the hospital, right? Wow. And as soon as Tomas lands it, he looks back at the bench. He looks back at us and all the players, and he's got his tongue hanging out. <laughs> he, 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 like, looked like an, an American basketball player after he hit a three. That's what Tomas looked like after he landed that ridge hand. And that was the moment where we were like, all right, these guys – these guys know what it's like over here. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, uh, I think, I think we went on and, and won the whole team fight thing that U S open. No, he, uh, he was fire. You know, what's crazy, Jack. I mean, you bring up a great point. Um, and, and I, I don't mind the flack, but if you look at it, even the NBA have recognized that they've had such an influence mm. uh, on, on the European talent and that they spent a number of years following up on this, the Greek freak. So mm. you would pass up signing a Greek freak because he's from, like, come on, no, you're gonna pass up Luca? No. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's what these guys were to me. Uh, they were amazing talents that if they were in the US, I'd pick them up in a heartbeat. And the funny thing is, uh, you know, Steve Babcock is one of our co-founders, who is the reason why we're here with Paul Mitchell. He told me, he said, Damon, uh, you know, every Hungarian you get financially is like three Americans on a budget. <laughs> so you're not gonna be, and I said, Steve, give me my fab four. I'll take it. I'll mm -hmm. take it. Uh, whatever the budget would allow me. Uh, and yeah, but I, I, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say no to Luca. You wouldn't say no to the Greek. You wouldn't say no to Antetokounmpo. Like, come right. on, come on. So yeah, right. I, I think I was just a little bit ahead of my time on that one. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so speaking of being ahead of your time, now we're going to throw it back a bit because this whole okay. show so far, we've been talking about everybody else. We've been talking about all the people you've coached. Uh, but as we can see, uh, what's going across the bottom line here is all of your accomplishments as a competitor yourself. Right. So take us back to the beginning of that journey for you in the Bay Area, scratching and clawing your way up, making it to the NBL, winning Super Grands, doing yeah. NASCAR, winning NASCAR the same year. Tell us about that journey and, and some of those highlights along the way. Yeah, you know, my journey is it's 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 the journey of a, of, of a kid who grew up trying to be like his dad, um, idolizing his father, who he's seen on uh, Karate Illustrated and all these other uh, media outlets from back in the 80s um, and just wanted my dad's approval because uh, mm -hmm. that's my hero. Uh, that was really my motivation. Um, I started in 1980. Uh, in the five and under division uh, <laughs> and just kept fighting from there. Uh, I got my black belt in 1991. Uh, in about 1987, my dad started um, having me drive with him because uh, there was another uh, guy from our school, our sister school from Costco, Sean Adams, uh, who was the first West Coast guy to win the Diamonds, uh, one of my classmates, one of my senior classmates. Um, my dad was working with Sean along with uh, our instructor, Sifu Bill Owens at the time. And I got to go to Tacoma, Washington as a blue belt in, in the junior division. And that was like my first NASCAR. It was Mad Dog Steve Kern's tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm fighting in that and I'm a junior. And it was just a different, it was a different thing. And I knew why my dad took me there. We drove like 16 hours to get there. 
Uh, and he was just planting that seed of this is the next level. Look mm -hmm. at Sean. You're nowhere near that. You're still a blue belt, but this is the next level. Uh, and I start really scratching and clawing uh, to get to that. Um, I was a big baseball player. I love baseball to death. Um, but when I was in uh, ninth grade, a freshman in high school, I got what's called uh, Bell's palsy, uh, which Ooh. is like a, a form of a miniature stroke. Uh, so like the whole left side of my face uh, was um, was paralyzed and I couldn't close my eye, couldn't move, couldn't smile, couldn't suck out of a straw, nothing like that. So what happened with baseball is uh, my, my pupils wouldn't dilate on the left side. And so I couldn't blink. So I couldn't be an outfielder no more because when the wind blew, I can't do anything to blink. Um, so it was just, and I just gave up on baseball, but I was really good in baseball. Uh, but as soon as that Bell's palsy hit me in ninth grade, I gave up on it. And then the weird thing is headgears came alive because uh, we weren't wearing headgear till then. So it's like 87, <laughs> 88, and then now you're wearing headgear. Uh, and then headgear came out. And then I was like, I, I felt a little insecure about the Bell's palsy. Um, but I felt like I can hide it when I put the headgear on. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to put all my energy into sport karate because I can hide this little thing that I'm tripping off of. Uh, and I can still do my athletic thing and I'm not outdoors. Mm -hmm. And then I can still be like my dad. So I, I prematurely gave up on my baseball and I just dove head on into sport karate uh, to the point where I would train with my dad in the morning uh, before I go to school. And then after school, I'd come back, teach two classes and then train with him and the other adults uh, six, seven days a week. Uh, that's all I did. Um, going, growing up in California, uh, there was royalty, man. There were, for me, as a young, humble kid, there were sport karate gods. Uh, you know, there was uh, Tony Satch Williams, who was in the movie Lionheart. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a legend. Uh, Woody Sims, uh, who just like one of the most winning, winning as heavyweights of all time, just winning everything out there. Uh, Richie Barfield, who was the first person on Paul Mitchell to be selected from the Bay Area, from California. So Richie's always been near and dear to me as an example. Uh, and these were the guys who I had to go through once I got my black belt. And so I got thrown in the fire uh, because these dudes were all about pride. They were all about tradition. And they were all about if you're from Cali and if we ever pass the torch to you, it's because you earned it. And so they beat the living you know what out of me uh, my first year as a black belt. They weren't playing. Uh, but the, the greatest thing that ever happened to me uh, was I fought Woody Sims, uh, who's still to this day one of my biggest mentors and who I owe a, a lot of thank you to. Uh, I fought him and I was just intimidated because he was my hero. Uh, he was the guy I looked up as, to as a kid. And I'm just like, I can't score on him. I, I already had it in my head. You know, he, I just looked at him so legendary, like I can't be the guy. To, you know, so I went out there half stepping and he just swept me, dog walked me. You know, in California, you can kick in a groin. He drop kicked me, swept me. I mean, he's just, he's doing me dirty. And then at the end of the fight, he said the most profound thing. He grabbed me and he shook me. And he said, hey, I know you're better than that. I know your dad trained you better than that. You fight me like that again, I'm going to knock you out. Mm. And I knew what he was saying. He, he took off the competitor hat and he put on the big brother hat. Mm. And he's like, dude, do your, I just seen you beat everybody in the division except me. What, what, why, why aren't you fighting me like you fought them? And the next time we fought was at one of my first NBLs, uh, Gabriel Naga's mom threw a tournament in mm -hmm. San Diego. And I fought Woody and I was scared and I was shaking. And every time I went forward, I paid the price, but I did go forward and I ended up beating him. And he had more joy than I had. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of like lineage I came from, from California. Uh, and I had to go through all those guys, Richie, Satch, the whole nine yards. Um, my first chance at a world title was uh, 92 Super Grands, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Now, the reason why you're going to hear West Coast guys say Super Grands is because we couldn't afford to go to Nasca, man. It mm -hmm. wasn't that we weren't good enough. It wasn't that uh, we were intimidated by Nasca. It wasn't that we had to have tournaments that kicked in the growing. We couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. I'm a high school kid. I'm from East Oakland. Right. It's $600 flight. It ain't happening. Not, mm -hmm. not on my parents' budget at the time. So NBL was a, an easier route for us to fight in national tournaments financially because it moved all across East Coast and West Coast, not predominantly East Coast. So 
man, believe it or not, Jack, and this is why I keep talking about humble and kids that are going to appreciate the sponsorship because my first chance to fight for a world title in 92 at Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, my church was my sponsor. Mm. My church. Uh, my mom got together. My mom's very religious. She's a minister. Uh, I appreciate all of her prayers. Without her, I probably wouldn't be here for sure, uh, just from her prayers alone. Uh, but my mom got together with the church and they sold barbecue dinners. And all I had to do was deliver them to all these people who ordered them. And then the profits would come back to me. And that's how I got my hotel. That's how I got my airfare. That's how I got uh, my registration. The church started my career. Uh, based on the idea that my mom had. And uh, for me, if I don't meet kids who are like me when I was 18, I don't even want to fool with you. I don't want to bring you on the team if you're entitled, if you feel like the world, you know, I, like you're the man and you don't appreciate the process. No, because mm -hmm. I'd have been doing NASA a long time ago if I had the financial backing. So, man, I took that opportunity and I ran with it. And in 92, man, I got all the way to first and second, and I fought my hero, Tony Satch Williams, and we went at it for three rounds. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had him, uh, but I was a no-name. He was a celebrity. A lot of close calls went his way, as it should. I'm nobody. Uh, mm -hmm. And I learned a tremendous lesson from that. But the best lesson I got from that was uh, a year later, Satch had got a new sponsor, with uh, Russ Folks and the Professional Karate Commission, the PKC with Glenn Keeney, mm -hmm. and they were starting a U.S. karate team. And the first person they picked up was Satch and then Woody Sims. And then both of them said, hey, we know who we want to fight teams with. And they picked the snot-nosed 19-year-old from Oakland. Mm -hmm. uh, and the lessons I got from those two that year, we went undefeated. We didn't lose to anybody. I won my first grand. The, I'm the first fighter to win an international grand. In the NBL, the Tiger Bomb Internationals, their first year in the NBL was 93. Uh, I was the first fighter to do that. And those mm -hmm. dudes were behind me, coaching me and telling me, you can do it. Pretty much the same way I do it to Alex. They're telling me I can do it point by point by point. And I'm starting to believe what they're telling me. And mm -hmm. I'm getting better. And I'm believing in myself. And what those dudes did for me, I can never repay them. And from there, it was on. After that, Jack, it was on. Uh, mm -hmm. 93, uh, 92, I got second. 93, I said, I'm going to win the NBL. And then I ran into a guy by the name of Jeff Newton. Mm -hmm. Amazing fighter uh, from California, from Bob White School. Um, and he was on DKT Force One. He was one of the first California guys to get on another East Coast team. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jeff was kicking down the doors along with Richie Barfield to sort of get the West Coast recognized. Uh, and me and Jeff had three classic rounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up winning my first world title, fighting the toughest guy on the planet. And now I'm focused. I'm like, let's go. I'm like, I'm going to win the overall grand because Richie Barfield did it two years in a row. And that's how he got on Paul Mitchell. And I want to mm -hmm. get on Paul Mitchell. So <laughs> I'm going to win it two years in a row. And then they're going to bring me on. And so I fight Ray Wizard, legendary Ray Wizard. And he shows me that, yeah, kids, you're in college. You're 19, <laughs> you're fast, you're really good, but the fight IQ isn't there. And Ray beat me fair and square, and I lost in the runoffs. And he helped elevate my game mm. because I was so mad at myself uh, because my dad was telling me all the stuff I was doing wrong in training, and I just didn't make the adjustments, that when we came back in 94, no one was going to beat me. And that was my <laughs> mindset. No one. So I ended up winning the uh, I was like the last person to win the NBL overall grand in yeah. 94. Uh, man, they had some legends there. I ended up fighting Mike P on stage, uh, mm -hmm. who's my brother from another mother, uh, somebody who I respect dearly. One of the baddest dudes I've ever fought. Uh, we put on a hell of a show. Uh, Leo Creer and me ended up being the finals. And it was just an amazing, amazing week. And the cool thing for me on that one, Jack, not a lot of people mm -hmm. know, just my students. Um, my dad was not an emotional guy. Uh, he was very old school. Um, I didn't, my dad wasn't the guy to high five me or tell me you did a great job. The, the way I knew I did good is because all of my dad's friends knew what I accomplished. And when I was talking about, Hey, you won so-and-so how, you know, and it was <laughs> my dad. So 
I figured out how my dad, I figured out his language of love. And I think mm -hmm. he just wanted the best for me. And he wanted me to keep pushing. Uh, but my, my probably the highlight of my career is after I won that tournament, uh, there's a picture of me holding my dad. And both of us got watery eyes. I got my NBL jacket that says overall grand. Only one person gets that every year back then. And my dad looked at me and said, hey, son, you'll never have to fight again. Mm -hmm. And he said it with, you know, with watery eyes. And I knew at that moment, uh, the kid who sat there idolizing his hero, watching my dad fight the legends, uh, I had his approval. And mm -hmm. that's all I ever wanted. I wanted to make my dad proud because I saw how hard my dad worked for our family. I saw how hard my, my dad worked for our karate school. Uh, I just saw how hard my dad worked uh, to try to be, to help me be the person I am today. Uh, mm -hmm. So when he said that, uh, there was no way I was going to quit because he probably knew what he was doing. He fired me up. And man, from there, it was on. Uh, I won every overall grand there was to win uh, in the NBL. Uh, Boyce Idell even referred to me as the fighter of the 90s uh, mm -hmm. back then. Uh, and it, it was a good time. And that was my young pride. That was me being like a young Bailey Murphy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was when I was young, just going at it and fighting some legends. I mean, Ray Wizard, Leo Creer, Alvin Prouder, Jose mm -hmm. Pacheco, uh, Mike Pombero, uh, NBL was stacked. Calvin Cross from Texas. When you talk about people that hit, Calvin Cross Jackson hit me in the mouth one time and my lip busted in three spots. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> But that was Calvin Cross. You know what I mean? And it was just the NBO was off the hook back mm -hmm. then. It was amazing. It was amazing. And yeah, from there I went crazy. My first uh, NASCAR as a black belt was like 92. I got second at the Battle of Atlanta. I used to do one NASCAR a year because mm -hmm. that's all I could afford. Um, and then I came back um, in 93 with Satch. And the biggest life lesson, and again, I owe Richard Proud and um, a lot of respect uh, because he sort of had that uncle energy as well just like woody and like satch i went through everybody at the battle of atlanta in 93 we were in the omni center uh, where the atlanta hawks played i fought at least 15 times i didn't know that nasa could do seeds i didn't know who that richard plowden was uh I, I didn't care who anybody was i had satch williams behind me and i had woody sims so i didn't care who was there uh a little naive because <laughs> dudes uh <laughs> you know what i mean but i'm 19 i'm feeling myself and it, it's, it's time to get busy. And I go through everybody and I get the, uh, to Richard. We're, we're the last two. And it was first to five. And I think that match lasted about 12 seconds. <laughs> he hit me with two kicks in the ridge hand. And I remember being mad at myself and him being the OG that he is. And people don't understand like why sometimes when fights were over, I would talk to a guy in the ring or even as a coach, I'll tap a guy on the butt and I'll say something. And it's because of my own journey. And mm -hmm. Richard grabbed me and he's like, hey, young fella, you're really good. And he said, I, I, I saw you whoop on everybody. I saw you putting hands on everybody. But he said, I noticed you start off slow. Mm -hmm. And I said, if I'm going to get this kid, I'm going to jump on you. And he's like, but the fact that this guy who's an OG legend was like, hey, you're good. Mm -hmm. It really fueled me to, to get in the lab and continue to trust the process and trust the training uh, that my dad was giving me. And from there on, man, it was just, it was crazy. I would, I would get to sneak to Anaska like once a year. Mm -hmm. uh, it was hard financially, but I always was in that mix. But man, yeah. I could be on the line all day just talking about the 90s. Well, <laughs> well I, I mean, such such a powerful story. And it looks like Angel Diaz chimed in in the comments. Like, love learning all the history. It's so cool to get to, get to hear like this path that, that you have traveled down. And, you know, one of the one of the things that's most fascinating about it is you're hard pressed to find somebody who had the level of success that you had both in the NBL and on NASCA, um, especially as as a heavyweight point fighter. Right. Uh, the, the, the list of those names is very, very short. Um, so as one of those people who had success in both leagues and, you know, kind of saw that full evolution from the heyday of NBL to NBL starting to fizzle out more and then NASCA kind of becoming the one premier league, at least yeah, in America. Yeah. We'll talk about Waco in a little bit, right? But between NBL and NASCA, talk about the differences that you noticed once you got to fighting at a high level in both leagues. Was there one rule set that you preferred? Um, so just take us through 
that experience because yeah. again, there's so few people that have had it at the highest level. Yeah, no, great question. Um, you know, I, I, I my, like I, my, my first NASCAR as a brown belt, uh, no, my second, uh, after I did 87 Tacoma, my dad took me in 1990 to the battle, again, to watch my classmate, Son Adams, uh, who had an amazing fight with Nasty Anderson that year. Um, and I was a brown belt and I won first place. And that's the first time I seen Christine Bannon, uh, Pedro, uh, Hakeem Austin, uh, Mafia Holloway, Jose Pacheco was on stage that night, Alberto Montron, uh, and then like the whole cast of what would become mm -hmm. the Ninja Turtles, uh, Wholesome yeah. Pack, Whole Young Pack. <laughs> it was, I was, and it, it was this, man, I was like, yo, NASCAR is off the hook. <laughs> the production value, everything was crazy. Um, and it really fired me up to try to do that. Um, I, I would say like some of the biggest differences, the, the upside to the MDL that I thought was very cool was that they would change the, the, the rules every year. So one year was no growing at all the tournaments. The next year was growing. So you, you had to be able to party both ways. So it wasn't like they were catering to East Coast and it wasn't like they were catering to West Coast. It's like, if you're gonna do it long-term, you had to be able to show skill sets on both, which I thought was great. Um, I like the NBO uh, fact that they let you fight on the ground for three seconds. So you mm. can do ground techniques, drop kicks, uh, different tactics. You can do cartwheels, um, different things that you couldn't do in NASCAR. I like that. Um, I like the, probably the, the biggest thing I like NBO to NASCAR, but I, I love NASCAR as well. But the biggest thing I liked about NASCAR it, when NBL is as far as this, the feeling of accomplishment once you got the world title was different. Uh, so I, I had the opportunity to win multiple world titles in NASCAR and multiple world titles in NBL. And NASCAR, because it was a point system, um, you know, I felt good because I was the dominant fighter every year that I won. But I would see other divisions where the, the guy who got third all year long, because he went to a bunch of more tournaments than the guy who got first all the time, and that guy became the world champion by points. And it was... It, it just didn't feel the same. It, it was just, it was the world title, uh, the feeling of achievement, winning at a Super Grands felt like a Super Bowl. It felt like a mm -hmm. World Series. It felt like a prize fight. Like if you didn't do it that day, it doesn't matter. It doesn't right. matter what you did the other 10 months, nine months. And so there was a little bit more sense of accomplishment and then also a sense of defeat. You know, I, I've blown uh, a couple world mm -hmm. titles in NBL. So I know what it's like to literally you lose, you blew it, and you're going in the back and you're grabbing your second place belt and the tears are coming down. And you're mm -hmm. like, I don't want to feel this again. And, you know, I, I, I lost to Satch in 92. Uh, and these were the life lessons. I mm -hmm. lost to Ray Wizard in 95, uh, second place. I got back at him in 96. But Ray <laughs> was always that dude for me. Uh, and then uh, I got a little lackadaisical with uh, not figuring out how to train the way I used to train and now being a police officer. And in 99, Brian Pimple caught me slipping. Uh, and he came in, BP cut the weight. Uh, he came in amazing. Uh, he was fired up. And I, I was too complacent. I'm like, I beat him a couple times already. I don't see any issues. And he gave me a great lesson. Mm -hmm. And we had to dance some more after that. And we had <laughs> some great fights together. Uh, but there was a lot of learning from that. Uh, but th those are the really key points with the NBL and NASCAR. But the biggest thing I would say about NASCAR was, I think they got, they had more of the world-class fighters at their event. Um, mm -hmm. So I always appreciated and respected that. Uh, same level of talent, they just had more of it. Uh, right. They had more of the sponsors, man. They had Paul Mitchell. Uh, they had DKT Force One. Mm -hmm. uh, they had Metro. Oh my God, Metro was amazing. They were off the hook. Uh, they, they were just killing it. Uh, and just more and more and more teams. So there was a little more flash and more, more financial sponsorship. Mm -hmm. uh, on the NASCAR side. Um, also, I love the intensity back then in the 90s of the NASCAR circuit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would see Paul Mitchell on one side, Metro on the other, and just as they're lining up to do team fighting, they're eyeballing each other, they're slapping fists with each other, they're screaming, the teams are getting loud, and they haven't even said fight. And it was just, I was like, ooh, there's a different level of... Uh, pride if you will uh it's, it's a lot more on the line and that 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 energy with the nasty events it was addictive it was like i gotta be a part of this um so the the world championship stuff i would hate i i wish we had something like a super brand 
Like you were the guy that day and you that you're the champ, like mm-hmm. any other sport. But we have sort of the NASCAR kind of feel with the point system. So when when you win, you win. You feel great about it. But I think that would be amazing if they did that. That's one thing that NBL did really, really good. But I, I'm blessed to have the opportunity uh, to compete in both. Uh, I thought Mr. Carnahan had a class act organization and uh, Boy Slidell. And, you know, I was the biggest thing with the NBL for us back then was you wanted to be on the cover. Mm-hmm. If you got to cover the magazine by far. <laughs> You were the best forms, weapons, or fighter. Uh, and uh, I was blessed to be on the cover twice, uh, once in 95 and once in 2000. So um, that was always a big deal for me. And I still got the copies because I, that was a goal of mine as a kid uh, who, when I was a brown belt, I was looking up to Richard Barfield, who was mm-hmm. on the cover. And I was like, I want to be like Richie. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, both of those um, outlets really fueled uh, my focus as a young adult. and. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Right. And, and I love what you bring up about the the culture of NASCAR in the 90s and those team fights where guys oh, wow. would be eyeballing each other and yelling. Because honestly, like when I – my first NASCAR was uh, Bluegrass of 06 and then like U.S. Open of 06 is where I really kind of like figured out this is what I wanted to do. Nice. Right? And, and seeing guys like yourself and the way that you would carry yourself before a fight – um, and then I went back and people that watch this show know I'm, I'm a huge film study guy. So I've gone back and I've watched those fights from the 90s. I've watched those team fights. I, I saw from a young age the way that those competitors acted. And, and it's something that's so interesting because I've seen that part of the competitiveness fade away from the sport. Because yeah. I remember like sure. I'm, I'm certain there are people who competed against me that probably think that I'm either a jerk or I'm crazy. <laughs> because of the way that I would pace up and down the side of the ring, because of the way that I would warm up. And throughout my career, there were very few people who would meet that in, that energy, right? Uh, I, I can probably count on one hand the people that gained my respect because of the fact that they met my energy, that they would Absolutely. eyeball me back. You know what I mean? And Absolutely. that's what I fed off of. That's what I loved, you know? And um, so I, I love the fact that you bring that up because that's something I feel like our sport does need more of. For sure. I think it's great that everybody's friends, but when it's time to step in the ring, you don't have to be. You got to be able to flip that switch and know when it's time for business, when it's time to go compete for what you've always wanted, and when it's time to go hang out after the show, right? Two very different things. Um, Absolutely. and, And I think that I love what you bring up about how NASCAR and the way that the NASCAR World Championship is organized makes it feel like it's not that major Super Bowl type event like winning a Super Grands was, right? And that's why I talked to Carmichael Simon. Uh, we had a text exchange about this a few months ago. And on NASCAR, it's more of like tennis or golf where you've right. got the Grand Slams. And like, yeah, there's other events over the course of the year. And sure, you might happen to pick up the FedEx Cup off your points or whatever. But – at the end of the day, the Masters, the the PGA Championship, the Open, that's what you care about. And that's kind of how sport karate has been, whether it For be sure. the U.S. Open, the Diamonds, the Battle, the Warrior Cup, whatever the case may be, right? Um, so I, I do think that's an interesting discussion, and we could probably go down a, a three-hour uh, rabbit hole about <laughs> all of that. Uh, but while we're talking about differences between leagues and everything, um, I also want to mention Waco, get your take on that. We've talked about a few Waco fighters, um, but I just kind of want your take, since we're comparing NASCA and NBL, yeah, where yeah. is Waco? fit into that mix and as a point fighting coach what do you see as the most for lack of a better way to phrase this like the premier organization to compete in because both sides kind of have their argument right yeah no that's a great question i I think the premier organization would be a healthy mix whoever creates or one of the organizations sort of look at what both they're doing the nbl i'm excuse me nasca and waco and just sort of that would be the best organization because mm-hmm. they both do some really, really cool stuff. Um, Wacko, I, I, I don't like the body, the body jab. Uh, it, it's just, I just think if we have techniques that's not transferable to actually combatives, then it, it won't really get the public's eye. They're mm-hmm. going to have to see what we do and say, oh, that could be done in a real fight. Like in a back fist to, to your, to your chest is, is not it. Um, but I do like the two rounds. I, mm-hmm. I, I like that a lot. Uh, I like the structure uh, with the officials and how the officials are, man, they're dressed the same. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they run the rings a certain way. I like how they stop the clock. You got to fight a real two minutes. Right. Like there's some really cool stuff that uh, Waco does. I, I just, I hate it. Not that I hate, I now understand mm -hmm. um, that it's not, their view of sport karate is not an American view. So for me coming up in the eighties and watching, uh, you know, Keith Vitale and watching, uh, you know, Bill Wallace and watching Nasty Anderson and mm -hmm. all these other guys, they, they hit people <laughs> very hard. Right. Joe Lewis, he, with that sidekick, he was killing people, you know? Um, and so when, when you talk to them, they'll say, no, uh, this is light contact. That's for kickboxing. But our attitude in the States was, uh, you know, the Kumite was full, full all out. It was, yeah. I never did tap. Like, Nobody that fought me would say, like, Damon was a tapper. Like, no, I fought, and the only thing it was, I would just stop when they said stop sometime. I know there's people on the line like, no, they, they hit late a lot. <laughs> it, and I'm going to tell you what a great coach told me, and his name is Don Rodriguez, the greatest of all time. He said, Damon, it's not that you hit late. They called break too early. <laughs> that's what happened to me. But uh, I, I think Waco, Waco's, it, it, it's, an, it's a great organization, but I, I would like to see more contact. Uh, and they do some really cool stuff. Uh, but I, I think we got to get rid of the elbow pads, both mm -hmm. leagues. Um, and I get it. And I, I think it's probably because of the blitzing, because everybody runs and yeah. they do this. And it just, it just shows you, okay, if you got to wear an elbow pad to do a striking art, maybe that technique really isn't an effective combative because you're giving up your head, you know? So, it, and then, you know, like the real blitzers, to be honest with you, uh, Ray Wizard, Eddie Flash Newman, Brian freaking Ruth, mm. uh, their blitzes, they didn't have to wear no head, no, no elbow pads because <laughs> they didn't do all that with their head. Those dudes were hitting you for real and they were working with great footwork and you were getting two, three, four pieces of a punch on yeah. your body. And it was real and it was legit. You know, mm. Brian Plumple. Had a great blitz. BP had a great blitz. He didn't need an elbow pad. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't need an elbow pad because he's hitting me with his elbow. He wasn't doing that. He was coming in with the speed and the technique. So I think if, if we can change some of those rules, that would be great. Now, here's the other one for you. Hey, Jack, man, at some point we got to get rid of the headgear. Mm. If we're talking about universal appeal. Right. If we're talking about TV appeal, our sport would look so much better. No elbow pads, no headgear. Look at the magazines from the 80s. And then look at the magazines now. And you'll just be like, it, it has a different energy in the picture. And the picture says a thousand words. The right. picture now has the headgear and has elbow pads. And it looks okay. The pictures back then, nothing. Mm. You can see the grunt. You can see the facial expression. You can see the fire and the passion and the fight in the fighter. It, mm -hmm. it looked more serious. It looked more legitimate. And I, I just want to see our sport be legitimate. I hate um, not really being able to tell people I work with, like, hey, I did this for many, many years. Because they've heard of me as a martial artist. Mm -hmm. But very rarely can I find something online now where I'm like, hey, this is how I used to fight. Or this is the sport I do. It's like, I'm not going to show them that. Now, you yeah. show me a video of Cam Dawson, then I'll be like, yeah, this is how we used to fight in our day. <laughs> Cam reminds me of he's an 80s fighter, but he's going to yeah. be that because of his dad. It's the way he's raised. It's the only thing he knows is how to fight old school. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it's just me being an old salty timer, but I, I would really like to see some of the contact come back just so that we can get that universal appeal because I think our sport is amazing and it can blow up. We just got to get it in the right hands. Right. I love the vision that you've got. And, and Cam's a perfect example because Cam shows how it's effective, right? Like there's a reason that when Cam fights, he is the favorite to win the grants. You know what I mean? And, it, and that is with, you know, regardless of, of how much he's been showing up to tournaments uh, or, you know, having a kid and all of that stuff that's been going on, it doesn't matter. When Cam shows up, everybody's like, it's, it's almost assumed like, okay, it, Cam's going to be in the heavyweight grants. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and and it, it, it's a testament to how effective that style of fighting would still be. And I love the way that you have that vision to, and you know, when, when Keith Vitale was on this show, he talked about how back in that era, sport karate fighters were superstars. Like they, sure. they could fly to Italy sure. to go to a tournament and they would get recognized because that's how big sport karate was. Wow. And if that's what the wow. sport looked like back then, 
maybe we need to look a little bit more like what we used to look like. You know what I mean? For sure. Um, and, and more prize money too back then, Jack. Yeah. You know, he was making more money back then. Oh, you yeah. know, we're talking about 30 some odd years later and we're not making the money that, you know, Mr. Vitality was making back in the day. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Over the course of this show, we've done a lot of name dropping. And by the way, for the for the Jax Rudolph podcast, Faithful, I know we're, we're pushing an hour and 20 minutes here on a show that's normally an hour. However, it's been a while since we've had the show. Coach Damon said that we could have as much time as we wanted. So it, if, he, if he cuts me off, we'll be cut off. But we still <laughs> got some really good stuff to get into. And one of the next things is uh, we, we've been dropping names this whole podcast, and we can tell how, how proud you are of your, your California, your Bay Area heritage, right? And sure. one of the things that you told me you wanted to talk about on this show was going through a countdown of some of those top fighters in the history of California sport karate. Man. I got to hear this list. So I'm, I'm going <laughs> to let you give it to us. Now, you know what's crazy? I'm, I'm going to probably get in trouble because there's so many greats. And you know what I'm going to do as a humble Black belt. I'm not. My name ain't on the list, man. Mm. I, if if I had my, I'm gonna say my California ten, but you're gonna notice I have a couple more names in there because I, I couldn't get it right. But my California ten, all time for like what I can recall, and I'm mm. sure there's some legends uh, that might have been before my time that maybe my my dad just didn't get to give me the history lesson on. Um, but man, if I put these ten. Mm -hmm. In this state, against any 10 anywhere, and let me tell you something, Boston by itself got some savages. Mm -hmm. You could just go out of Mr. Pena's karate school alone and have a top 10 that could take on anybody. You know what I mean? Yep. Pedro, Alberto, Mafia, <laughs> Reggie Perry, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Didi Baptiste, like the list goes on and on. Uh, but here's my California 10. And I... You get another fighter up here. I want them to show their history, and we can just keep these these tens around and just sort of, you know have a little uh, a little internet fun with these. But I would no order, no order, Jack. Don't don't hold me to an order. Got you, Alvin Prouder. Mm. One of the few to do full contact and point, winning both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I hope my history is correct. But my understanding is Nasty Anderson trained with uh, a guy named Chicken Gabriel out here in L.A. So my understanding is Nasty is a Cali cat. If I'm wrong, somebody dial it in, let me know, and I'll take Nasty off. But Nasty. I was about to say, you're there. claiming you're cla Canada. Canada's going to be upset if you're claiming Nasty. But, but Nasty moved to Canada for business. That's true. But, I, That's but true. Na Nasty, hey, my dad didn't have money to go to Cal uh, Canada. They were fighting in, in Oakland. <laughs> Back in the day, <laughs> um, nasty. And, and not only is, does he have the greatest nickname in the mm -hmm. history of sport mm -hmm. martial arts, but that dude is probably the 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 goat the goat when it comes to the will to win. Like mm -hmm. that era, that dude with all that competition, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, number three, Tony Satch Williams. Uh, Real hitter, crazy speed, uh, unbelievable talent, Kaji Kempo legend. Man, this dude beat me for a world title, and he stopped me from winning the overall grand in 93 at the Super Grands. He beat me at my prime as a youngster, Ray Wizard. Mm -hmm. I know why that dude was called the Wizard. Unbelievable. <laughs> a real fighter, as scrappy as they get, not scared of anybody. I want Ray Wizard in a foxhole with me any day of the week. Uh, Woody Sims. Woody Sims, uh, 1992, 1993 NBL Super Heavyweight World Champion. Um, I was not going to gain weight, Jack, until he left the Super Heavies. Once he <laughs> retired, then I had a couple cheeseburgers. Then I started fighting Super Heavy. But your boy, I was doing vegan before vegan because I wasn't going to fight Woody Sims. <laughs> Absolutely not. Wasn't going to happen. Number six, Raymond Daniels. Mm -hmm. R.D., some Cali, baby. Mm -hmm. R.D., Arguably, possibly the greatest fighter of all time, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, and especially for sport karate legitimacy, I'm going to give Ray number one. Mm -hmm. As far as legitimizing our sport, if Joe Rogan is bringing up one of our guys on the Joe Rogan podcast, that dude's doing some amazing stuff for our sport. Yep. Um, number seven, Jack Felton. Mm. Iceman is probably the youngest on my list. 
but I've seen Iceman since he was an Icy. I've seen him since he was a popsicle. <laughs> he's been killing people since he's like eight years old. Jack Felton is that dude, man. Jack Felton took that crown from me and Raymond. Mm -hmm. I pass it to Ray. Ray pass it to Iceman. I don't know who's going to take it next as far as mm -hmm. California, but Iceman, I need him in that 10. Mm -hmm. Hey, number eight, you might be sleeping on this guy. Unbelievable. Like I said, when I went to the, uh, as a brown belt, when I went to the Battle of Atlanta in 90, he was on stage fighting for the grand, and I, I think he was fighting Pedro, Ooh. Jose Pacheco. Okay. Jose mm -hmm. freaking Pacheco. Uh, multi-time national winner, uh, multi-time NBL world champion. Uh, we have some classic battles. That dude is one of the toughest SOBs I ever fought in my life. And he's all a 5'5", five five, uh, and he was a headache. Mm -hmm. And Jose would hurt you. He'd hit you late. He'd get in your face. And he could kick on both legs and amazing hands. Mm -hmm. uh, totally underrated. First ballot Hall of Famer, Jose Pacheco. Uh, number nine, this is where I've started. <laughs> Leo Creer, mm. Warlock, mm -hmm. the slickest, sickest, lightweight, possibly ever out of Cali. Mm. Sick, crazy legs, crazy hands, and he could talk trash better than anybody. <laughs> Leo was my guy. Uh, we fought against each other for many years, and then we linked up as teammates, and it was – Man, it was superpowers, and we, we connected on Bayer's best. Uh, Leo Creer. Um, so number 10, <coughs> Jack, I got four names, but it's 10. It's all 10. <laughs> I'll count it. I'll count it. Richie Barfield, first West Coast guy to get on Paul Mitchell, won back-to-back -back, uh, NBL overall, overall, overall grands. Um, Sean Adams, first mm -hmm. diamond ring winner. The mm -hmm. Bradys know about Sean Adams. Because mm -hmm. the Bradys fought with Sean back on the Power Up team back when I was a youngster, 88, 89, 90. They were amazing. Gerald Dawson would always tell, tell me, like, you train with Sean? I'm like, yeah. He's like, Sean Adams is crazy. I'm like, oh, he's amazing. Sean Adams. Uh, Sam Montgomery, one of our full contact sport karate legends out here in California. Um, total goat. Total goat. Um, uh, Steve Sanders, a.k.a. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, uh, the founder mm -hmm. of BKF. Uh, amazing. Uh, the fastest hands ever, uh, one of Ed Parker's uh, premier students uh, and just a legend uh, in the game. And then I got to throw in also in there, Eddie Flash Newman. Mm -hmm. Probably the sickest blitz in the early 80s. I remember my dad and my instructor telling me about this guy with this great nickname, Eddie Flash Newman. And the flash was real. That dude's hands were amazing. Uh, so that's my 10. It's sort of mm -hmm. technically 14. But man, and I know I'm missing some. And don't even put me on the list. But, mm -hmm. hey, you, I put that list up against anybody's list, and it would be a fun, healthy debate. But those are some soldiers. And there's others that got to be in there. Uh, Jeff Newton, and the, the list goes on and on and on. But just a couple of names. Oh, yeah. That, that's a crazy list. And I, I might have just gotten my favorite podcast quote ever saying that I've known the Iceman since he was a popsicle. Uh, and I can say that because that's my boy. <laughs> I, Jack Felton and yeah. Willie Hicks were two of the most amazing juniors I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. When I tell you we were on the top of our game, they're, they're in the 12 to 13-year-old division, Jack. We would, as headliners in the Super Grands, we would go and watch those two whenever they fought. That was, they would shut the house down. Mm -hmm. We would try to bring the energy that those two dudes brought when they fought each other. Amazing. Jack Felton, Willie Hicks, juniors, unbelievable. Un I haven't seen nothing like that since. Oh, yeah. And I'm a huge Jack Felton fan because, again, like we, we do like top fives and stuff like that on this show all the time. And I, I will die on this hill that Jack Felton is unquestionably a top five lightweight of all time. No doubt. I've, had, I've had people I've had people be like, no yeah, is this guy? I'm like, no, Jack no Felton doubt. is a top five lightweight all time. It, they have to look at the longevity, Jack. When you start mm -hmm. talking about all time, it can't be a two year run. And that's the difference between. You know what I mean? Like, no, Iceman, you got to do that. He's in his 30s. That yeah. dude was killing it as a 10-year-old, and right. he never stopped. Right. Like, no. You, and I, I'm, I'm with you always... on that, buddy. I, I, and and, yeah. and I've been on the other side of Iceman. I'm, I'm speaking of him like he's on Paul Mitchell, but I, I just respect – I respect the game. Yeah. I respect the game. Ice is absolutely top five, easy lightweights, no doubt. 
Absolutely. No doubt. That Absolutely. And you talk about like international presence too, because then like people bring that up. They're like, oh, well, like count these titles, count these titles. I'm like, hold on. If Raymond Daniels, his teammate, never existed, Jack Felton would probably have five, six, or seven Irish Open open weight titles. You know what I'm saying? If so Raymond Daniels didn't exist, of all of our resumes would be much better. <laughs> <laughs> Raymond, you owe me a couple of diamonds. You owe me a couple of U.S. Opens. <laughs> Hey man, nice. it, it, and I, I remember listening to Richard Plowden talk, and it was you know it it was like nasty. Nasty was that guy in that era. You mm -hmm. know, Richard was a great fighter, uh, and he was speaking about like how nasty nasty was. Like Ray was that for us, man. He 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 definitely messed up some of my uh, stats. <laughs> when, when, hey, when you're that guy, you're that guy. But we 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 danced a lot. We had a good time. But man, sure. I got so much respect for Ray. It's unbelievable. And while we're talking about legends and all these great fighters, right, I, I cannot do this show without asking you about that legendary CJB squad that you fought with, where it was you and Trevor Nash and Jason Tankson, one of the greatest three-man teams of all time, right? There's nobody that would want to stand across those three. So <laughs> tell me a little bit about that experience, fighting alongside those guys, um, and what, what was a three-man team along the way that, that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with you guys and, and that earned you guys' respect the most? Man, uh, it, it, that, that time in life just gives me chills. Uh, I, I, stay right here. I'm going to show you. This is in my house. Don't move. Okay. Don't move. Don't move. We're in for a treat right now, y'all. And this I'm is, back. I'm back. I just want to show you, like, that era. Like, to, so you get an idea how near and dear that is to me. Um the only karate pictures I have in my house are a picture of Kevin Thompson, and I got this picture in my house. That's awesome. It's in my house, uh, downstairs, super close. I mean, that that era was crazy. What we did was crazy. Um, it, it was the perfect combination. You had uh, Trevor Nash, a young Trevor Nash, uh, who was not scared of anybody, with the sickest left leg in the game, mm -hmm. a guy who liked to bang, so we fed off each other, mm -hmm. um, and the ultimate competitor. Like, Trev just did – losing was, like, not in that dude's vocabulary. Like, he he did not like it. He was allergic to it, He and he competed like that. Mm -hmm. um, Jason, you know, he was that era's Pedro. He was mm -hmm. the best kicker of that era and another fierce competitor. And let me tell you something. When Jason Tankston is on Jason Tankston time, ain't nobody touching Jay. <laughs> Jay was just that dude. He was that monster. Uh, and we battled for many grants. And he messed up some of my stats. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, Jay was the guy, no doubt. Um, and so you got these two young kids who were, you know, 19, 20, 21. I, I, got, I got a couple of years on them. And then you bring in this, this guy who's very seasoned, and I still got a chip on my shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, and I want to do NASCAR. And, you know, I feel like California don't get no love. And the energy there was amazing. We never had to pump each other up. Uh, we never had to um, motivate each other. Uh, the expectation was we were going to win. And we're going to go into a tournament. We're going to walk into the diamonds and we're going to have one team and no offense, but it used to motivate us. And I think it speaks to our chemistry uh, and it speaks to uh, Mike Conroy's ability to recruit and put us together. Um, but we would have one team and, and JBM was stacked, man. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the Raymonds, the Jotties, the BPs. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about Preston Clements. You're talking about Reggie Perry. Uh, Dean First and Gerald Dalton, like they were, yo, they they have two teams that could kill anybody. Mm -hmm. And we walk in with CJB with just three, mm -hmm. three people, one team. And we're going to, if we have to, we'll be both teams. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of years, that's what we did. Um, never easy, but we were very successful. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you got to put us up there. Like my favorite team was, you know, watching uh, KA. Uh, Pedro, mm -hmm. and then they would mix in who they would put in sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it was one of the Bradys. Uh, sometimes it'd be Alberto. Sometimes it'd be Steve. Those are some of my favorite teams. And then again, I love the Bradys and Mafia. 
Mm-hmm. Those are some of my favorite teams as well. You got to put us right there with them for our era, without, mm-hmm. without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and really, it was just a perfect mix of young, hungry guys mm-hmm. and a veteran uh, who, who had, had that fight IQ going, and we meshed well. And those two dudes, you know, the rest is history. But here's the funny thing. That's all three NBL collaborators. Just yeah. to give you an idea of the talent in the NBL. Those are all three NBL cats. Mike yeah. got all of those guys from NBL. Mm-hmm. Jason, Trevor, myself. That's right. Uh, so it was never that NBL didn't have the talent. We just didn't have the financial ability to come out there. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was it was it was amazing. And you know, by far that's the best team uh, I ever fought on. Uh, and mm-hmm. I, I fought with some legends. I fought with Chris McBride. I fought mm-hmm. with Leo Creer. I fought with Raymond. Uh, I fought with um, I fought with Jody before. We had a great time. Um, I fought with man Carlos Tierney, my mm-hmm. guy, my brother for life. Um, I, I fought with some really, really amazing guys. Jose Pacheco, mm-hmm. Satch Williams, uh, Woody Sims. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just goes down the line. But th- those two dudes right there, uh, there's a reason why they're there. It's, it's a picture of them in my house, and mm-hmm. that, that was a great time. And uh, I'm really glad that Mike uh, gave me a shot to 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 join the squad and try to add to that legacy back then. For sure. And I appreciate you sharing that because that is such such a cool like moment in time, those few years that you guys were together and and going up against JPM multiple teams. It's a a very cool part of sport karate history there. And speaking about uh cool sport karate history, right? Um a lot of times when people see you at a tournament and they see a diamond ring on your chain, they think it's cool, but they don't know what it means. Right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we brought up KA a few times now. And you're a guy that's been there at the Diamonds. You were in the final within one point of a ring of your own. But in my opinion, the ring you got is a whole lot cooler because the yeah. ring that you wear on that chain is KA's ring, right? So tell us about, first and foremost, KA, what he meant to you, as has been discussed many times on this show. But every single person has a KA story, has a unique perspective. Um, and then also tell us that story of, of you getting that ring and how special that must have been. Yeah, yeah, you know, it it, it wouldn't be. I got to show you guys. I, I don't know if you can see it. it this That's is probably my favorite coat, my favorite uh, shirt in, in my wardrobe, uh, for sure. When I hit the gym, when I take my runs, uh, when when I need a little up, when I need a little pick me up, uh, I got on one of my KA shirts for sure. Uh, KA was everything to me. Uh, on the team, um, we instantly bonded, and I instantly uh, got the opportunity to be his roommate. Um, so. I fell in love with K.A., the, the athlete, because, you know, he was like the eighth one of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, forms, fighting, just a beast. Uh, but I fell in love with K.A., the father, uh, K.A., the husband, K.A., the man, because uh, I got to see how he interacted with his kids, his wife on the road. Uh, I got to see how he was uh, very spiritual. Uh, he was very educated. And he was just always looking out for me. And um, th- that, that was just everything to me. Uh, as a kid who had the Woody Sims influence, the Satch Williams influence, mm-hmm. all these other guys did that for me as well. And then he stepped right in and kept that same energy. Uh, I, I, I can remember, you know, vivid, I can, like it was yesterday, um, I'm fighting at the battle and, and K.A.'s like, yo, I don't think anybody's won the battle three years in a row. And it was like the third year I was trying to win the overall. And, and I was telling Kevin, man, uh, I can tell my body's a little beat up, man. <laughs> Uh, something's going on with my neck because my fingers were numb and my shoulder was a little feeling a little weird and awkward. I get, I kept getting tingling and I, I knew I was getting on borrowed time. Uh, and KA knew that because we talked privately and I, I kept winning. I kept winning. I kept winning. And when I tell you that dude uh, willed me uh, to win that overall uh, to the point to where, uh, you know, I don't even know if people do that. He was just on the sideline. You can hear him if you ever watch the video. Let's go, D. Let's go, D. And he's just clapping. He got it going. Uh, and I know how he fired me up that when I went out overall, I gave Kevin half the money just mm. from clapping for me, just for cheering for me because it was authentic. And I knew I wouldn't have won without that because I was playing games with myself in my head because of knowing I got this little element from this neck injury and I, I'm starting to feel it come back to haunt me um, as it would a couple months after that. And I could feel it coming. And that that's that's the K.A. Like he reminded me who I was and he's like, I'm in this with you the whole time. Let's go. And I could hear him. And you would think like K.A. was a fan of me or something. And no, he, that was the big brother 
making sure the little brother handled his business. Uh, and we had that energy. And I remember we had a conversation from us being roommates. He's like, man, I remember uh, o- O2. I think it was O2. Man, you were killing everybody at the Diamonds. It was probably one of my greatest moments. Um, uh, I, I mean, I battled Brian, uh, I, I battled Trevor. Uh, I battled uh, Brian Plimple. Um, I had to fight Dean Furstenberg, who was the best 30-year-old at that time. Uh, then there was another gentleman, I forgot his name, but he was Nasty Anderson's student. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had he had got successful with uh, Jason. Uh, mm-hmm. And all my runoff fights, I won by five points. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember I fought Trev. I, I fought heavy. Trevor fought light heavy. I won by five. Everything was just clicking. Dean mm-hmm. Furstenberg, I won by five. Uh, the person, I forgot the young man's name. He was a stud from nasty school. I won by five. So I'm going in amazing. And, you know, I run into the juggernaut, which is RD. And we battle. And I was really sitting on that sidekick. And I'm like, I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. I'm getting, I've been getting everybody. And we clash for like a minute. And there, I, of course, I've looked at the video a hundred times and there was like four clashes where I'm one hand away from my two points. And we went at it and I had a lapse of judgment with the distance and Ray popped me. And once he popped me, he started doing his thing, which is smart. He started running. I started chasing. The rest is history. I lost a diamond. Uh, and I, I remember K.A. was talking to me about it. And he mm-hmm. was like, man, I remember you were on and blah, 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 blah. And he's like, man, you really did. He was like, you know, I was on the team back then with Ray. He was like, but you did amazing. You fought great. I was like, yeah, I blew it. I blew that one, bro. That was that was my moment. Uh, I blew that one. And we mm-hmm. would talk about that periodically. And unbeknownst to me, man, um, a little bit after uh, K.A. had got diagnosed with ALS, uh, he was like, hey, man, you've always been the champ to me. You've been the champ. Uh, the stuff you've done for this team, D. And K.A. was a big person on loyalty. Mm-hmm. That was Kevin's thing. Like, you're going to be loyal to this team, to this brand, to each other. And I think it was because of my loyalty, a- along with just our, our brotherhood, uh, for some unknown reason, Kevin decides uh, that he wants his diamond that he won uh, in the 80s, late 80s, uh, his only one, it, Damon, it's yours. Mm-hmm. And I wear that one more prideful than I would – uh, if I had that win against RD or the other four or five times I got close to the diamond. I've been in the final four for the diamond like five different times, mm. uh, dating back to 95. Uh, 95, I'm getting ready to fight Pedro. I'm thinking I'm going to fight Pedro. And this is why I say the youngsters don't understand there's no established legends, with the exception of probably Avery. And so it's mm. a young man's sport right now. Mm-hmm. There's no OG that's making you pay a cost to be right. the man. They're not doing that. Uh, 95, I win the heavyweight grand. I win heavy, I win the heavyweight grand. My first fight in heavyweight division was with Ernest Miller to give you an idea how the division was. Like, mm-hmm. it was no joke. My, I'm the first fight in the division, it's me and the cat. Um, and it was just on from that moment. Uh, and I won the heavy grand. And then so the final four is me versus the 30 and over winner, AP, Anthony Price. Mm-hmm. Then Pedro versus Tony Young. I'm naive because <laughs> I'm a West Coast dude. So I'm, like, I'm going to fight, fight Pedro. I got I got to get my head ready for Pedro. Man, I go in there. Number one, when AP got in the ring, I think he was like six foot 13. He just, <laughs> I'm like, wait, he, he didn't look like that big until he got on stage. And then it, it was like I saw his whole aura. And his whole aura had like every tournament trophy he won behind him in like yellow. It was glowing. <laughs> And so I just got caught up in the rapture, like, oh, my God, we're not worthy. And, uh, yeah, AP put the OG – he put the OG uh, smack down on me, and I, I blew that grand. And then Pedro ended up losing to Tony Young, and then the two OGs mm-hmm. fought for the ring. And that was 1995. And that's when I understood that when I get in my 30s, I'm still going to be a problem. <laughs> because when I was the young guy, the guys in the 30s were still a problem. Yeah. So all those grands uh, was in my 30s. That's when I got my shot to do a lot of NASCAR consistently. Mm-hmm. I was in my 30s. And I remember, you know, that rule of thumb. But, man, no. Uh, the diamond that Kevin gave me uh, is my most prized possession. He also gave me his commas uh, mm-hmm. that he used for competition, which are in a plaque. Those are at my school, uh, in my office. Mm-hmm. And to be honest with you, Jack, on those days where I'm tired from working a 15-hour shift, 
or I might have had a hard day at work or I'm dealing with murder suspects and different mm-hmm. violence and things like that. Uh, and I get into my office and I'm feeling like tired, like, well, my black belts can teach tonight. I'll look up at Kevin's uh, commas, which has a picture of me and him together. Mm-hmm. And I say, get off your butt. Go out there mm-hmm. and train. What would KA do? Would KA make an excuse? Did Kevin Thompson make an excuse the entire time he battled ALS? That dude was looking out for my my well-being more than he was looking out for his well-being. Mm-hmm. Like I had a, a a battle with cancer a little bit after uh, K.A. got diagnosed. K.A. called me every freaking day. A.D., making sure you're good. What's going on? What stage you in? How you feeling? Do you got to do chemo? This, that, and the other. And that's not stuff I tell people. Uh, that's stuff mm-hmm. I share at certain seminars when I feel like the need to share my story and inspire. Uh, but to give it the layers of me and Kevin, uh, mm-hmm. he's that dude for me. Uh, and that's why another reason why I'm probably really picky about putting fighters on our team, because mm-hmm. you're not going to put K.A. strong on your leg and you're not loyal. Right. You don't respect it. You don't appreciate it. Or you don't you don't you don't you don't reverence the legacy that is our team. Mm-hmm. I'm cool. I would never disrespect Kevin because Kevin was the ultimate Paul Mitchell guy. Mm-hmm. Ultimate. So yeah, no, that that ring is everything for me. Um and uh yeah, no, it, you know what? The Lord moves in mysterious ways, man. Because if I would have won, he would have never gave me his. Mm-hmm. And I'll take a KA ring over a Damon Gilbert diamond ring from O2 mm-hmm. any day of the week. Um he doesn't know what he done for me. Uh that dude has elevated me as as a man, as a human, as a coach, as a fighter. And the thing about Kevin is he always is like, he would call me coach. He don't have to call me nothing. Mm-hmm. He'd be like, hey, Coach D. And mm-hmm. he would just keep re- re-emphasizing, Damon, you got this. You got our blessing, bro. Take the team to the next level. Mm-hmm. And um, loyalty is everything. Um, there's nothing I won't do for uh, Kevin's family. Uh, he's, he's the man. He's the GOAT. The best overall all-around martial artist ever in sport karate. And I, You know, I, I told Coach Rodriguez this. You know, you got the Heisman. That's named after somebody. You have the Lombardi Trophy. That's named after somebody. Don't let me be a tournament promoter because you want Kevin Thompson's at your tournament. That's Mm -hmm. what you want. You want forms, fighting, weapons at a high level. That's what you want. Every overall, it shouldn't even be called an overall grand. Who's the Kevin Thompson Award winner? Mm -hmm. Who won more overalls than Kevin? Around the board, weapons, forms, fighting. That man fought until his late 40s. Like, don't let me be a promoter because I'm not even going to call it grand champion. Mm. Lombardi is Lombardi. You know what that means. Heisman is Heisman. You know what that means. Man, give me a Thompson. Mm. I don't need an overall. Give me a Thompson. Mm. Oh, I got the Thompson Award three years in a row at the battle. Hell yeah. Mm. But we don't do that in our sport. Mm -mm. We don't promote those that should be promoted. We promote the event. We don't promote Mm. the fighters. And that's why BJJ is kicking our butt. Hey, Gordon Ryan, they promote the hell out of him. He's everywhere. But he makes that sport big. Mm. Let's promote. Promote these superstars. We we didn't get to take advantage of the Raymond Daniels. You didn't get Mm. to take advantage of the Damon Gilberts in their prime, the Jotty Tensions, the Trevor Nashes. You didn't get to take advantage of the the Pedro Xavier's and all the other greats, the Kevin Thompson's, the Nasty Anderson's, the list goes on and on. Man, somebody got to figure out there's a movie coming out about Nike. Mm-hmm. And when Nike wasn't Nike, they gambled on a guy named Jordan. Mm-hmm. And the rest is history. Right. We have to start thinking like that because we have some amazing people. And we have a lot of amazing backstories to our champions that mm-hmm. people have no clue. People don't know Damon Gilbert battled cancer. People don't know Damon Gilbert fought and had Bell's palsy this entire time. People yeah. don't know my father died while teaching a class to his death, holding bags, doing a boxing class. And I had to go and see my dad dead in the middle of my floor. Mm. Like there's, there's so many stories mm. of inspiration and purpose within our martial art community that we have not explored. That's probably more telling and more selling than just the kicking and the punching. We got some great people in here. We got black belts. We don't just got bar fighters. We got black belts with some real stories. And that's why I make it a point to make 
the few seminars that I do agree to go to, because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not going to whore myself out and mm -hmm. give this away. I'm not. There has to be a real purpose. I got to have some kind of spiritual connection mm -hmm. to the person who's asking me to come teach, because I'm going to give you all I got. And all I got is not only the techniques, but it's my testimony. Mm -hmm. Because that's, you're going to, what happened? Hey, my greatest accomplishment, Jack, it ain't mm. the battle, ain't the diamonds, it ain't the NBL overall. Man, it's coming back from cancer. Mm. That's my greatest opponent. That's my greatest W. Because nobody ever made me deal with depression. Nobody ever made me deal with, I may not be here for my kids. Nobody even made me deal with, I may not be here for my students. That opponent did. And I had to get myself together, bro. Mm. I had to get right mentally, spiritually. I had to get on my knees. The man upstairs humbled me because I thought I was the man. Mm -hmm. Nothing could hurt me. I'm this, I'm this total bad, you know what? I'm a badass. I'm a top level officer, respected throughout the country for teaching officer survival. Former world champion, coach of Team Paul Mitchell. Really sexy guy if you like guys with full lips. I'm feeling mm -hmm. myself. I'm having a great moment. And then I got humbled. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back and say, Man, where does my joy really come from? Where does my health and my wealth really come from? And the, the man upstairs got my attention, and I'm glad I'm here. Mm. I'm glad I'm still here. I'm glad I'm I'm glad I did what my dad taught me in 1980, which is to get your hands up, get off the ground, make adjustments, and keep fighting. Mm. And sometimes that goes deeper than sport karate. Sometimes that goes into life. So, man, Kevin's ring for me, Jack. It's everything, mm -hmm. bro. It's everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, 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 so much wisdom in all of that. And, and thank you for sharing because it was, it was so powerful, so inspirational, so moving. Um, every aspect of that story from your, your personal struggles and obstacles to your personal triumphs, the, the role that Kevin played in some of that and, and really every step of the way, right? Um, just it's so profound, everything that we got right there. It, it almost makes me just want to be like, all right, we got to, we got to call the show right there because there, there's nothing more to be said. Right. Um, but I don't want to end the show without having the opportunity um, to ask you about, and you've alluded to it a few times, um, but everything outside of the martial arts world, right. Even though the martial arts informs every aspect of your life. Right. But the work that you do as a police officer, and I'll brag on you for this, right? Uh, not only doing it in Oakland, which everybody knows is one of the baddest groups of police officers on the planet, right? Thank you. Um, Thank you. But on top of that, you're a, a Silver Star uh, awarded officer, right, for, for your heroism. And you can speak a little bit more to um, exactly the, the circumstances of getting that award if you'd like to. Um, but truly uh, accomplished and, and very, very highly regarded within that field. Um, and I want to give you an opportunity to speak about that um, because that is more important than any, than any karate game we can play, right? Um, and again, thank you for your service in that regard. And, no, and thank you. the floor is yours to, to speak about it. No, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, my, my, my law enforcement journey is uh, 26 years this year. Uh, Last month, made 26 years, uh, so I'm getting close to the end. Um, uh, I'm a street, I'm a street cop. Uh, I did 20 years in various patrol functions. Um, uh, I worked in our drug task force. I worked in patrol as an FTO, a field training officer. Uh, then I worked as a foot patrol unit. Uh, and then after 20 years on the street, uh, I went into backgrounds of recruiting because I just wanted to bring in the right people. And then now I'm a, a supervisor uh, in our in our training section. Um, and the entire time I've been a cop, uh, I've been part of our defensive tactics program uh, and then actually have been the lead instructor for that uh, for about the last 20 years, um, which is I'm in charge of teaching the 800 to 1,000 professional staff and police officers that we have in our department, making sure that they're safe. That's why you keep hearing me sort of say like, um, like sport karate credibility. Like I don't want people to think that sport karate guys uh, can't fight. They don't understand real self-defense. Uh, because no, I've, I've worked for 26 years in a city that's top 10, most violent in the, in the country. Um, I've had close to close to death situations that the reason why I'm alive is because of my martial arts. Um, so that's why I'm real. That's why I, I have so much respect for Raymond and how he legitimizes what we do and other people that do it. Um, because 
uh, it, it doesn't make you soft or not, you know, reality based. It, it's just the sport that we choose to do. And no sport is a street situation. No sport is actual combat. The UFC ain't combat. The UFC is a sport uh, because when you hit the street, there's guns, there's knives, there's multiple attackers, there's no time limit, <laughs> there's no rules, and then there's and it keeps going. It doesn't stop. At the end of the fight, you don't bow. It's over. No. Now somebody may want to kill you two years later for what you did to them two years ago. So it's 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 a different kind of a energy uh, there. Uh, but you know, for me. The reason why I even did law enforcement is uh, I actually was a victim of like some harassment when I was in high school. Uh, there was a fight breaking out. Uh, my, my friends were walking across the street and there was undercover officers um, driving an undercover car. And the officer said like a racial epithet to one of my buddies, like, get your black, you know what, out the street. And my buddy didn't know he's a cop. So my buddy was like, what's up with you? What, what's, what's popping? And so the guy got out the car, then he flashed his badge. Um, and then, but at that time, my buddy was, he could see red and he was pissed. So then the officer was telling him, get up the street, you're jaywalking. They got into a verbal situation and the officer got physical with my buddy and my buddy tried to defend himself. Uh, and this is during like open lunch at a high school, a very popular high school. So there's about a thousand of us out here now. And so it's a big scene. They arrest my friends. Uh, the fact that my dad was a cop, um, I, I understood that there was good cops. And you can't judge them off of one person's actions. Mm -hmm. So while the crowd was watching the situation go down, I was actually uh, calming people down because people were getting pissed. Mm -hmm. They were like, oh, hell no. You know, they're, you know, he punched, he punched so-and-so. Why the officer do that? Everybody's getting mad. We're, you know, we're 18, we're 17. We're, mm -hmm. I'm a senior in high school. And um, I remember people were throwing uh, like cups and bottles at the officers because now it's a scrimmage line. Mm -hmm. So now there's a line of officers and a big gap in the students and they're telling the students, get back, get back, get back. And so I'm like pushing people back, like calming people down. I was a senior, I had a little influence. Um, so I was trying to calm people down. And so an officer gets hit with a cup. Um, and whoever threw the cup was behind me. Uh, it was like a McDonald's cup with ice. And the cup went over my head because whoever was behind me, because I remember I had like orange residue from the drink on me a little bit. So whoever hit the officer, hit him like on the shoulder and he's like facing sideways. And then he turns and he faces the crowd. Now I'm in the crowd of like a thousand, I'm like in the fifth row. And he, with, along with a bunch of other officers, runs through the crowd and lo and behold, he thinks I'm the guy who threw the cup. He grabs me, slams me, puts hands on me. It's all bad. I get arrested at 17 for doing nothing more than trying to make sure my classmates weren't acting crazy for inciting a riot and resisting arrest. So my whole senior year, uh, I didn't go to senior picnic. I didn't go to grad night. I did the prom. Uh, we had a little bit of money for that, but all my parents' money went to my, my dad getting an attorney for me. Uh, couldn't even buy a yearbook that year. Like all my parents' money went to me having an attorney so I'm not going to jail for doing nothing. Um, and when I went to court, the judge saw it. He threw it out immediately. He was like, this is crap. How could you, how could you, you know, he knew it. Uh, and I remember I was really pissed. I was really mad. And I was really like hating the police at that time. Uh, and I remember my grandmother who's still alive. She just celebrated her 90th birthday last week. Um, she's one of the greatest people I know. My grandmother saw that I wasn't myself and I was angry. And she said, hey, you got, you got two choices, Damon. Uh, you can harbor that hate that you have for the police and watch it tear you down and make you not be the man that you're supposed to be, or you can create change. Which one are you gonna do, baby? Mm. And I didn't know, I didn't know what my grandmother was telling me at that time, I was so pissed that they put me through this. I feel embarrassed. Uh, my parents had to go through all this. They had to, my dad had to work more overtime to pay for an attorney, thousands of dollars. I couldn't buy a class ring. It was just, you know, it was just horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and man, when I got to like 22, I was like, I want to be part of the change. Because I, I met a lot of great cops. All my dad's friends were great. And I was like, I want somebody to meet me and say the same thing. So mm -hmm. that started my journey, man. And um, I haven't looked back ever since. So I, I, I teach throughout the country, certifying uh, different law enforcement officers to teach at their agency, mm -hmm. the self-defense program. Uh, I was handpicked, uh, which is a huge honor of mine 
by Hiller and Hedon Gracie to mm -hmm. be one of their Gracie Survival Tactics instructors for the certified course. Uh, I've been involved with the Gracie Jiu Jitsu since 2008. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And uh, man, the sky's the limit. We're just trying to really uh, teach law enforcement nationwide uh, nonviolent body to body contact control tactics mm -hmm. and proper de escalation and like proper self control. Because uh, the more you're under control, the better you're going to perform, and the more you're not stressed. So officers have to understand stress inoculation. And once they get there, they're able to do some really special things because uh, people still need peacekeepers. They still need crime fighters. Uh, they still need guardians. Uh, they just want them to be uh, just. They want them to be civil and they want them to have a, a moral and ethical code. And so um, hopefully I did that in my 26 years. Never been sued, never been sustained for an IA complaint. Uh, my whole thing was I never wanted to disrespect the badge or the name that's on the front of my uniform, because then I'm disrespecting my dad, my mom, my grandmother, et cetera. So uh, it's been a really, really cool journey and uh, one of the best moves I made as a youngster. And I I, I have a lot of love for like um, uh, the UFC fighter who's a fireman and he's Steve. a world champion, the heavyweight. Steve Amey or Steve because I get it. People think, that's why I said we missed so many cool stories. Like I was a full-time cop working vice, narcotics and all that other stuff doing sport karate tournaments. Like I had a full career in a full school that I've owned for 27 years throughout this whole time. So um, God's just blessed me. And like I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a martial art junkie. I own a school. I teach all the time at the police department and I try to help people as much as I can on the street. So it's been an amazing ride, man. Amazing ride. And those that's thinking about law enforcement, um, just be the change that you seek. Don't let the media control the narrative where you think that every officer is a racist or every officer um, will put a knee on someone's neck. That's not the case. Uh, there's bad apples in every field, uh, in every walk of life. Uh, it's, it's all about what you're going to be when you get in that field. So I would like to encourage those that want to do it. It's, it's a very, it's one of the most noble professions there are, but it comes with a lot of responsibility. And if you're able to handle that responsibility and you have emotional intelligence, mm -hmm then you're ready for this job. If not, don't do it because you'll set the business back another 30 years and people deserve good officers. Well, I, I didn't think that we could end the show more powerfully than, than we had already set it up. But I mean, that uh, again, su such an amazing story. And thank you so much for taking the time to share. My uh, pleasure. So, so much over the course of this podcast. Um, thank you for giving us two hours as well. That, that was that was unexpected, but I think uh, that we've maintained great viewership the whole time. So I know I know the audience is appreciating it too. And uh, absolutely, we're going to have to have you back on the show here in a little bit to, uh, to anytime, share some more wisdom anytime. with us, and anytime. maybe we'll get into some, some more of those fun top fives and top tens and all that. Uh, but seriously, thank you so much for your time. Um, anything else? Any any closing message that you want to that you want to leave the audience with? No, I mean, this was, was just elevate the sport. Um, those that are young and hungry and humble, you know how to reach me. Let me know you're serious. I take resumes. It's a professional team. Let me know you're serious. Inbox me. Let me know you're serious. Uh, if you're interested in having me potentially do a seminar at your school, if you're serious, we'll talk and I'll come down and it'll be all passion. It'll be blood, sweat and tears. I promise you all three will be at my workshops. Uh, it's a different experience than anybody else's because it's mine. Uh, mm -hmm. And I love this sport. So, yeah, Damon Gilbert, uh, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me at a tournament. Hey, it's all good. Uh, but I appreciate it, Jack. Thank you for the uh, outlet. I don't do this often, uh, but I know you're, you're a class act. And uh, that's probably why I have so much to say because I just don't do this that often. Um, so, no, I appreciate being able to share my story. It's in the right hands. I feel good about it. I probably wouldn't do this to too many other people. And uh, keep doing your thing, man. This is a great podcast. This, this, you rock, buddy. You rock. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, Coach Damon. Uh, and again, thank you for everything over the course of the last two hours. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in. Show wouldn't be possible if you guys didn't tune in and watch it. And thank you to our sponsors over at Black Belt Magazine and Century Martial Arts. This has been episode 123 of the Jax Rudolph Podcast. Shout out. Breakthrough ALS, Kevin Thompson, Coach Damon representing. Um, again, thank you all so much, and uh, we'll see you next time. See you guys. Thank you.